as an actual textbook for this one. Oh, somebody's got to go get Cage. Because he's stuck out there with the tractor on the way home. I know he, him and TJ are out there, and I'm sure he, Southfield. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you. All right, I'm crossing my fingers and seeing if we're getting it. Are you guys seeing that? Um, Doug or Jason or Omar, any of you guys seeing that? It's your job if you don't get it. Yeah, I can see it. Time. All right. Yeah, it's there. I am so sorry for that, guys. It shouldn't take 45 minutes to get this all started, but that's what we played today, so. We'll get started today. If you guys are all right, we'll probably end up till 9.30 tonight just so we can make it through it. But um, if you can't stay for all of it, I understand too. Um, so tonight's goal, I'm going to try and make it through 10, 11, and 12. Um, 11 and 12 are a little larger too. So if we don't make it through, um, we'll have to play catch up. Um, there's a, the next few chapters as we start into like primary assessment, scene size up and all of that are larger. Um, so we may not make it through all of those that way. Okay. But we'll get through as many as we can. So chapter 10 is going to be uh, respiration and artificial ventilation. So some things uh, we'll hit on today. 
Um, we'll talk pathophysiology, um, respirations, um, positive pressure ventilation, oxygen therapy, uh, special consideration assisting with advanced um, device, um, airway devices. Some of this hopefully too after last week is um, a little bit of a repeat and we'll just add to it. So ventilation is a process of moving air in and out. Um, so inhalation is air in, exhalation is out. Which one of those requires energy from last week? What's that? Inhalation requires a, um, an active process, okay? And we've kind of hit on that too, right? The chest muscles, the diaphragm contracts, great souls, that negative pressure pulls air into the lungs. Exhalation is a passive, so everything relaxes and increases the pressure in the lungs and the thorax, and then air is forced out of the lungs. Did we do this one last week? We did not. We just did mine. These slides are vaguely familiar. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so tidal volume, though we hit on it, right? The amount of air moving in and out with each breath. And then minute volume is as much air as in and out of the lungs in one minute. We hit on this too last week, too, though. Remember, we want that the air's got to get into those alveoli for the gas exchange. Um, we, this is the new term that we didn't hit on. So as you guys breathe in and out, not all of that air makes it to the lungs, right? We have dead space is what they call it. And dead space is as you, um, like your throat and lungs. Um, when it goes through there, um, it doesn't reach in. We still have to fill that and move that in and out, right? So um, that's the dead space. That's also why we worry about um, like a shallow breath, because that dead space most of the time is about 50 to 60 ml or cc's so we have to at least get that much in and out just to get through that dead space even get through the lungs so that's where it ties in for us where we got to worry about it just know that there is that dead space we have to fill and air still has to exchange okay um the term you guys can see now too with it um you know i can see this too much on the test question but more of a Hopefully, you guys an understanding of it. So, alveolar ventilation refers to air that actually reaches the alveolar. Okay, that's really what we're after, right? Because it doesn't matter if we're moving air in and out of dead space. If we're not getting it into those alveoli, um, we're not getting into the body. It's got to get that cellular level. Right um, it can be altered um, by changes in rate or volume too. Um, it's affected by the very slow or fast rates too. And the other one that I'm going to kind of tie into it with that is the force of the air too, right? If you if somebody takes in a good deep breath and try and hold it into their lungs, you're forcing those portion of alveoli to open up. And now the, it'll increase the effectiveness of those alveoli because we're increasing the surface area on it. Um, so alveoli too is just some more of the pathophysiology there. If you picture for me, the way I always look at them is when you guys, when we were all kids, we'd get the bundles of balloons, right? Had five or six of them in it and they were tied in a string at the end. Picture that upside down in your lungs. So they're just sacs and bubbles that are kind of tied to each other in that way, in those alveoli sacs. And, and that's it's kind of a bulb. That's the best way I can describe it, give you kind of a visual of what it looks like too. And then around those are the arteries and capillary and veins, right? That are wrapping around those for um, blood to get as close to it because they are a very thin wall. And that's what allows oxygen to heart dioxide to um, be moving. Okay. The fusion, all that area, um, it's a passive, right? It does not require oxygen. But what we do have to have is a concentration difference. So it's always going to want to go from an area of high to low, but it is passive. And it does it both. So pulmonary respiration is when it does that in the lungs, right? So we have high concentration of oxygen 
in the lungs, high concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood. So in the lungs, they'll switch, right? So carbon dioxide is going to get offloaded from the blood into the lungs. Oxygen then is going to get onloaded from the lungs to the blood. Then when we get cellular respiration, it's just the opposite, right? We have high CO2 in the cells, low CO2 in the blood, high oxygen in the blood, low oxygen in the cells. So it's just going to reverse that process. Um, the thing to remember with it, though, is it'll still do that without its passive. We don't have to have energy that way. So when we start doing CPR and stuff that way, too, that's the other reason um, we don't have to have a lot of energy. Um, like cell, like the ATP that we talked about last week, we don't have to have a lot of that going on because it's just a passive rate. So you can have somebody that actually um, is, by all points and purposes, dead, but still, we can still respirate a dead person. We can still respirate a dead person because of that, because their body doesn't, it doesn't take any energy. Um, we've hit on this one too. Like we said, the cardio and the lungs, cardiopulmonary, they have to tie together. There's just no way one works without the other. Um, when either one of those fails, the process of respiration is defeated. Okay. Um, we get a little bit on ventilation perfusion, the BQ match, right? If there is, if we're ventilating somebody, but we're not perfusing, meaning the heart's not pumping blood around, it doesn't matter. If we're pumping blood, but we're not ventilating, it's the same thing, that VQ mismatch. So they both have to be working together to have it work at its most efficiency. Um, so mechanical failures, we're gonna hit two don't think in these chapters. I think because I was looking into some of the cardio ones in the future. Um, mechanical, there's two different types of failures when we start talking with heart and lungs. So there's mechanical failure, meaning some part of the heart, um, whether it's a valve, whether it's a muscle, um, something's failing on them. Okay. And then we have electrical failure too, which is what you'll see on an EKG. So we'll hit today on mechanical failure. So it's a system that uh, limits the ability to create and change pressure. So if we have a stab wound, um, okay, now I know why this one was. So we're talking right now about the lungs. So this is a mechanical puncture of the lungs. So in the mechanical parts of the lungs, we have the rib cage, right? We have the muscles, and we also have those airways the ability to constrict or um, bronchial constrict or bronchial dilate to allow air in and out. If for some reason we lose the mechanical part of this, um, now we're gonna we're not gonna be ventilating or breathing in. We hit the, the second part of this, the loss of nervous control makes it impossible. So that's the C1, C2, if we get a spinal fracture we're going to lose that nervous control, or it can be a um, mechanic or a drug, excuse me. So certain medications, like we said, with narcotics and opioids, it limits the ability to tell those respiratory muscles to contract and take a breath, and they literally suffocate because the chemicals have told it not to do that. That's really the only two that you'll see with the respiratory system as far as a nervous, which is why we mainly talk with mechanical. Um, we talk, you know, with the stab ones too. It's easier for air to come in through a rib cage and a stab than it is through the throat. And we'll start to get um, lung collapse that way. The nervous part of it, those are the only two. It's either medication or we've had a complete separation of the nervous system. With the heart, when we start talking on it with cardiopulmonary, it can have some electrical failures on it and just affect it and the efficiency that the lung or the heart pumps. Okay. Um, painful chest. Has anybody broke a rib? Okay, when you get when you see those guys with a broken rib, they're gonna take a very um, shallow because it hurts every time they breathe that broken rib is going to sit there and move and 
and the, the nerves and the damage in it. So they're going to want to take um, very small uh, bronchial constriction. What's a, a bronchial constriction you guys can think of? Asthma. Asthma is a big one. Okay. Or allergic reactions are the two big ones. Okay. Um, also, too, if we don't have the right concentrations, right? We have to have that high and low. So if we're breathing in air that has a low concentration of oxygen, we're not going to create that high concentration in the lungs to have them diffuse out, okay? So if we have low uh, levels outside in the air for us in the line, this is a big one that we worry about that we can see, right? Where like Jason and Omar, you guys, um, if we come into the section and somebody's down, that's a big one to look at especially if we have multiple people in the section down. Um, also too, um, we get that diffusion, right? We have to have a concentration gradient. We have to have a high in one and a low in another. Um, so some issues with blood that carry it. So anemic, right? If we don't have the iron, we don't have the hemoglobin, it doesn't, the blood doesn't have the ability to transport oxygen around. Um, we'll hit more on this one too, but another issue that I'm going to add to this mechanical failure is when you see a smoker or somebody that's had um, a burn, anything that's damaged those cells, right? So they can, for the other one, so for us in the coal mine, we call it black lung. So if we've been in the coal dust and now those alveoli are just packed full of stuff, um, coal dust, they're not going to exchange the oxygen. The other term you'll hear in rural and farming communities, they call it brown lung. So especially in the old days, we didn't have covered tractors with um, filtration systems and stuff in them. So we were in the dust all the time. And so these guys, when we looked at their lungs, it looked like coal miners lungs, but it was brown instead of black. So anything that gets in there too, that's a mechanical failure, right? If it's plugged and not flowing through it, we're going to have an issue. So there are two disease processes that way too. Um, the other one too that I'll add with this too for children, have you guys heard of like when we put a neonate for surfactant? Have you guys heard of that with children? So surfactant is a natural occurring substance, hopefully, um, that a baby or whatever, and even us do to a point, will produce, and that kind of holds open those alveoli like too. So if we had a little baby, a neonate or a preemie that was born between 34, you know, earlier than 34 to 37 weeks, they may have a surfactant deficiency. And so it's the same thing. We have those mechanical failure. We're just not holding those lungs open. So when we took with respiration, it's adequate versus inadequate breathing, right? Um, we have to have the adequate because we've got to get those steady supply of oxygen for a normal function. These two terms, I promise you, you will see over and over again if you do anything in healthcare. Um, hypoxia, we don't say that they're low on oxygen, we say they're hypoxic or they have hypoxia. And hypercapnia is a high level of carbon dioxide. Why do those two things matter to us? We, as you guys have read through the book of stuff. They're both byproducts, right? So hypercapnia, that's actually what, in 90% of us, that's what drives our respiratory rate, is the levels of um, carbon dioxide in the blood. And then we, learn, we don't want low oxygen because then we lose that concentration gradient. They're both tools that we use to um, evaluate how well we're, um, our respirations are going. When you guys get on the ambulance, we can measure both of those two. So hypoxia, our oxygen saturation, which goes on the finger. And then we do have uh, caponography, which measures carbon dioxide that consists a little bit of goes and then helps that will measure it in the breath. We can monitor those two things that are, and they're the two things that really, really show us how well we're doing.
Um, so when the cardiopulmonary system, it, it'll try and compensate for that hypoxia and hypercapnia. Um, so the chemoreceptors, that's what it's measuring the carbon that's going to cause it to breathe more rapidly. And we can also increase the respiratory and heart rate to try and get those uh, more oxygen and blood flowing to them. And then the blood vessels constrict. So respiratory distress, um, at this point, our compensation is working. We're still going to see the patient has normal mental status, which is our hallmark when we start looking at adequate and anything really when it comes to the respiration or cardiopulmonary heart rate, all of that looking mental status. Um, skin color and oximeter are going to be reading normal. The only thing we're, we're going to see is an increase in normal. Heart rate and breath rate. And you'll see a little bit of an elevated blood pressure. We're trying to shunt the blood to the core part of it and the core border. Um, respiratory failure. Now our compensation is not working. Now you're going to start to see just the opposite. They're going to have this altered mental status. Skin color is going to start to go pale if not cyanotic. Um, and then also, the ex your pulse ox is going to start to decrease. Okay. Normally, for us, we say it's anything below 90% to about 85% that are respiratory failure. If we can keep 90 to 96, um, they're just in either normal or respiratory distress. Respiratory failure is a precursor to respiratory arrest, especially, especially, especially in children. If we don't Hopefully we can catch it in respiratory distress before we're going to respiratory failure. But if you don't correct this respiratory failure in a kiddo, you're headed for respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest. Um, inadequate breathing occurs when the challenge is too great for the body's compulsory mechanism, mechanisms. Does that always necessarily mean that we're running or exercising or anything like that? Now we can have a failure of any, whether it's medication, um, age, um, heat, hyperthermia, all of those can affect it. We do have to watch this though. Um, it takes a keen, and I, I don't like the term that they use this one with as far as keen assessment skills. It takes a, just a thorough assessment. Okay. And a lot of it comes with just looking at people. If you start, Handling people, the sick versus not sick. Um, most of it, you're just, we'll teach you the assessments and we'll go through it. A lot of it, though, you guys know what somebody should look like. And if you walk into a room and they're obviously breathing hard or color's bad or whatever, it's going to throw a red flag to you. And then we're going to show you this, teach you some skills um, to prompt that action and some tools and tricks to help you that way to hopefully. Um, prevent it from going into respiratory arrest. Patient assessment. Okay, this is a big one too. These slides, this next two slides, um, I promise you, you're going to see on psychomotor, meaning our hands on, and you will see questions on the national exam on this one. Okay. So patient assessment, when we start looking at breathing, obviously the first step we're going to look at is are they breathing or not? Okay. And what are, what are we going to look for for there to see if they're breathing? Chest rise and fall. Okay. Um, sorry, you guys are writing and I'm asking questions here. Okay. Um, this determine though, second, if they are breathing. So if they are, if they're not breathing, we're going to move to bagging it. Okay. We're going to start breathing for them. Okay. Um, second is determine is the breathing adequate? Part of that too is that if we're seeing an equal expansion of the chest um, when they inhale, um, the first time you see an unequal chest, it's, a, it's like, whoop, yep, yeah, that's what it is. Because you literally see just one side, they call it paradoxal, when we move into a little more movement. So one side of the chest will be moving where the other won't. 
the other indication, if you're not seeing equal chest rise and falls, we probably have a collapsed lung, right? There's something underneath it that's not allowing that chest to rise like it should. Um, air is hurt entering and leaving the nose and mouth and chest. That's where we're going to do the look. So this one we're looking. Now we're going to listen. And then air is felt moving out of the nose or mouth. Um, so look, look, the look, listen, and feel method. How long should we do that look, listen, and feel over what kind of time frame? About 10 seconds is it. Okay. So if we're on scene, chest rise or fall, or equal chest rise or fall, or air coming, or hearing air coming in and out, or we're not seeing it in a matter of 10 seconds, it's not adequate, and we're going to go ahead and move to artificial ventilation, which we're going to talk about when we're going to start back. Skin color is another one too. Uh, if it has, if it's adequate, it's going to have the typical coloration. The thing I'll tell you with it though is it's a later sign. So if we're seeing really pale skin or cyanotic skin, um, it's a late sign. So they've been in it for a little while. Okay. We're going to look at the rate and so how fast the rhythm is it fairly um, rhythmatic, meaning okay, about five seconds, they're going to take another breath. Oh, another five seconds, they're going to take another breath. Or is it a little short breaths and pause, and then short breaths and pause? That's what we're talking with the rhythm. We're just trying to see, is it normal? Does it march out? Or do we have some alteration in that? Um, the quality. We're going to hit OPQRST, which is what a lot of these tie into, too. So the quality is, is it deep or is it shallow? And then also that's your breath sounds with the quality. Do we hear rails? Do we hear wheezing? Um, do we have diminished breath sounds or when we take a breaths with our stethoscope? Are we hearing equal over and four quadrants? So some of these we hit the same on them too. So altered mental status is our hallmark, and it's usually your first sign that you're going to see. Um, we chest movement, we hit on pulse rate is slow in children. Um, their little heart, you start bagging them, you're gonna, you can control their heart rate with their oxygen levels in a lot of ways. So for children, we're going to look at that pulse rate. Um, breathing movements are limited to the abdomen. So if they're obviously in respiratory stress, and now all this breathing is their diaphragm, but they're still in respiratory distress, the only reason you're not seeing their intercostals or their, their neck is they're headed for respiratory arrest and they're just done. Those muscles are done. Obviously, if we're not hearing the breath sound or hearing the air coming in and out, and breath sounds are um, diminished or absent. And these ones, though, guys, that breath sounds, you're going to have to do that with the stethoscope. And then we've talked to on the wheezing, the crowing, um, any abnormal breath sounds. Same thing if the breathing is too rapid or too shallow, right? Both if it's on either side of those spectrums, the shallow or labored. Cyanosis is a very late sign. Um, in fact, with kiddos, like when you, if you get a chance to do uh, like have CPR or a, a newborn is born, you can bag them and within 30 seconds, the cyanosis will go away. It's not quick to react. Okay. Um, if they're unable to speak, and then the nasal flaring, it ties this to track to kids. But if you're seeing that in an adult too, that's a bad sign too. Okay. Um, oxygen saturation readings are low. The book says 95%. You won't see the national necessarily tie it to a percent because it depends on elevation, right? Most people here, you and I sitting here at this class, having no issues at all, if we put a pulse on, you can do 95 to 96, just because the oxygen, the oxygen concentration of our elevation is low enough, that's what we're looking at. So for our area and our elevation, we usually say 90%. And then the body position, that's the tripoding, right? Elbows on the knee, sitting in a chair, leaning over, 
doing whatever they can to take the weight off of their chest and lungs. Hypoxia, the medical term for it is an insufficient supply of oxygen to the body tissues. So that doesn't mean we have insufficient oxygen in the environment, it's at the tissue level when we're talking about it, okay? Um, some common causes for it, fire, right? Fire needs oxygen, so it'll burn it and then it's not there for you guys to breathe. Um, patients with emphysema, COPD, also to hit on the patient overdoses, and the depressive respiratory rate, most of the time it's an opioid or an opioid or narcotic. And then if the patient has a heart attack or a stroke or an embolism, what's an embolism? Bomb, yeah. Hallmark is the altered mental status. And then cyanosis is a late sign. If we can, we're gonna address the cause with it, right? If it's emphysema and some of that, a lot of times they just need a high concentration or a high flow of oxygen. Get them out of the fire if we can. Um, for your drug overdoses, we can give naloxone and Narcan uh, to try and counteract those drugs and get the respiratory drive coming back. Patient care. Most of this we kind of hit on too, right? If they're not breathing or if they're breathing inadequate, we're going to do the artificial ventilation for them. That's the big one we're going to hit on. Supplemental oxygen. Uh, we used to hit all the time, and I'm glad a lot of the, the exam stuff or the NRNT are not that way, but um, it used to be high flow or non rebreather Every patient used to get that. Um, and now we're just looking for that 95% mark, so a cannula or a non rebreather Most of our patients are just going on a cannula. And you're going to have to intervene um, when you see this signs of inadequate breathing. So a question for you guys, um, is it better to be too aggressive or not aggressive enough? It's better to be too aggressive. With airway management, you want to be aggressive. We want to be suctioning the airway, we talked on that. Um, we, want to, we want to be um, more aggressive than not. No, and by that, it's just meaning like we're not going to aggressive versus not aggressive is more. We're not going to set and wait and see. We're going to start into the inter intervention. We're going to start giving albuterol. We're going to start a low flow oxygen and then we can go. If we don't see any changes in 30, 40 seconds, then we're going to go ahead and bump to that. And if they have some fluid or buildup in the mouth, we're going to suction that out rather than waiting for them. So yeah, it's not necessary like, okay, we're gonna get in and spray finger or getting physically aggressive with them, but we're not gonna play the wait and see game. We're gonna start in treatments and interventions with them. So positive pressure ventilation. Um, when we take a breath, we create a negative pressure in our lungs, right? So air flows from a, um, low pressure, or excuse me, we create a pressure decrease in the lung when we take a deep breath. So we have a high pressure outside, we create a low pressure in our lungs when we take a breath, so air comes into that, okay? We can't recreate that with um, a body, with the body, okay? There's no way I can come over and grab your diaphragm and pull it in and out to make it air come in and out. So we have to create a positive pressure to force air into the lungs, okay? So instead of having a negative pressure in the lungs to force air into it, we're gonna create a high enough pressure that we're gonna push air into it. Um, it relies on a force that is exactly the opposite of the force that the body normally uses. Okay? So because of that though, we have to be there are some negative side effects to it, right? This isn't how the body is set up to do that. Um, cardiac output and blood pressure drops because of the heart's ability to refill its chambers is affected. 
It's the same thing as we're pushing that lungs, filling that lung with pressure, puts pressure against the heart. Most of the time that's minimal, but if you are monitoring it really close, like if you in the cath lab and they put those in your vessels and monitoring the pressure, there is uh, a little bit of a pressure decrease, or decrease. Most of the time for us, you're not going to see it because our machines just aren't that accurate. They're not in the blood vessel, they're not doing that. If we're starting to see some of that, we may want to start looking at this gastric distension. So gastric distension is um, air converted into the stomach. So when we start talking on positive, as we do it, we're just gonna, as soon as you see that chest rise, when you're bagging that person, you're gonna stop. Because once you created enough pressure to leave the chest, now the next easiest place to go is the stomach. And you watch your stomach get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? And it only holds so much. And once it hits its limit, what's the only way it has to get rid of it? They're going to vomit it back. Okay. But it's not just air that's coming with it, right? It's any stomach fluid, any stomach material. So we don't want that um, being in the airway because we can aspirate it. And most of the time when people die after they've been ventilated, when going to cardiac arrest, if they don't die from a cardiac event, within the first 12 to 18 hours. The next thing that we have to worry about is aspiration pneumonia, which is the second biggest killer of this. They get the stuff in the lungs, they get pneumonia, and they just can't fight it. So we have to be very cautious about when we're back in this guys. Um, hyperventilation. This is what I'll tell you, is you guys see people doing it, it's they're going to sit there and hyperventilate them. So they're going to just sit in there, man, it's clipping away on that. Okay. And here's the key, key that I'm going to tell you guys to do it with them because it does two things for you is focus on your breathing. Okay. All right. I took a breath. I took it over just three or four seconds. So I'm going to give the patient a breath over three to four seconds. And then I'll wait. Oh, they took another breath. <coughs> oh my gosh excuse me um so it helps so you don't hyperventilate these guys it does two things it also if you're hyperventilating most of the time you're causing some serious gastric distension with it and then on the vascular level um it's thinking we're moving the blood around too fast and we're getting rid of it too fast so it's going to constrict these vessels to try and slow the blood flow which most of the time when we're trying to respirate somebody or in cardiac arrest that's the complete opposite of what we want those vessels to do we want them to dilate and let it go through okay um, there's three common methods um, mouth to mask which if you don't have, um, like for your guys' jump kits and stuff or in your cars, those pocket masks are great. Because um, when you guys exhale, even when we breathe out, um, our exhalation has usually around 19 to, or excuse me, 19 to 18 and a half percent oxygen. So we're still going to be able to give them some oxygen. Um, it's great that way just because it's small and easy. Um, two rescuer bagging, um, when you guys get doing it in the field and doing it with the mask, by far the best. If we're having to use the valve bag mask, it's the best because you can get a good seal um, and then you can do minimize our gastric distension. That way too. One rescuer, we're going to teach you that. Um, it's effective, it works very well, it just is hard to get a seal especially on somebody that has a beard, um, doesn't have dentures, some of that kind of stuff, that it's hard to get a seal on. Um, never ventilate a patient who is vomiting or has vomitus in the airway because it'll go into the lungs and they're gonna ask for it. Um, we've hit on this one too, to ensure ventilations with lots of chest tries and fall with each ventilation. As soon as you're gonna see it, we're gonna stop. Ensure the rate of ventilation is sufficient. You guys know what rate we're trying to get. 
8 to 12, 6 to 10, depending on the textbook. So right around 10 a minute. So we want one about every six, six to eight seconds, depending on the textbook. And that's what most the National Registry, when you look at their physical exams or their psychomotor exams, it's that six to eight is what they're looking for. But if you have a test question for it, that's the one you're looking for. Um, inadequate. Ventilations occur when the chest doesn't move or the air escapes around the mask if we can't get it concealed or if the rate is too fast or too slow. And that comes back to our minute mark, right? Um, techniques should always ensure adequate protection from the patient's bodily fluid. Uh, mouth to mouth ventilation is gone. I told you guys when we did CPR, I don't do that. I won't do that. I've done it once in my career 10 years ago. I will never do it again. If somebody pukes in my mouth, I'm going to be fighting a bleach. I'm going to be puking in the corner, and I am done, 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 done. Okay. Um, if you need, it, if you have to do it, you're going to use a barrier device. Um, the pocket mask, by far, are the preferred method. They also have some, like a plastic sheet. It looks like um, press and seal foil, and in the middle of it, it has a uh, about a one inch square of an N95 filter that you can use that for too. So if they had like COVID or anything like that, it won't pass through that. So any kind of a barrier device. If you don't have one and we're worried about ventilation, you can work, talk about some positions and things like that too. But use a barrier device. Yeah, we'll go through some. Um, so we'll go like um, down tree medical one, have some really cool jump kits that we'll kind of show you guys. They're fairly in the back. Like 18 by 24 inch, and they're fairly inexpensive considering what's all in it. But we'll go over some of those. Ventilating a patient who's breathing rapidly. Um, we're going to carefully assess their adequacy of respiration. Meaning with that, is it deep? Or are we just moving, we talked about the dead air space, right? Are we just moving air in and out of the dead space or are we getting enough of a breath that it may be making it to the lungs? We're gonna explain the patient, the procedure to the patient. Um, these guys are conscious and we're going to be doing some um, positive pressure work, okay? So we're gonna tell them, you're gonna when you put this mask over uh, your face. Um, the best way I can explain it to them because a lot of times these patients that we're doing to it have a CPAP or have this BiPAP, and we're just going to tell them, hey, we're going to uh, imitate the BiPAP or CPAP machine with this pressure, with this BVM. Okay. So we're going to explain to them. Um, if not, we're going to tell them, hey, when you take a breath in, we're going to back. We're going to push a little air and try and force that air into it. Okay. We're not going to do it on every breath. We're going to try and do that about six to about 10 to 12 times a minute or every six to eight seconds. We're going to do that. Okay? Um, place the mask over the patient's mouth and nose. After sealing the mask, we're going to squeeze when the patient takes a breath in. If they're exhaling out, where is the air going to go when we push it in? Stomach. Okay. So we have to time up when they take a breath in. Um, adjust the rate over the next few breaths to ventilate fewer times with greater volume. And a lot of the time that you find um, with these guys, when we start doing that, their rate is going to drop on its own because the body, right? It's only, it's trying to compensate. So the body's not getting enough oxygen, not able to get rid of enough CO2. So when we do that, now the body's saying, oh, okay, it's working, we can slow down. Because it doesn't realize it's creating its own problem when it's doing it. The compensatory methods at this point are just making it worse. So we're going to adjust the rate over the next few breaths to ventilate fewer times with greater volume. Um, a lot of the times, too, with these guys, they're going to get anxious with it. So if you have to, to get them a few times, too, the other trick that I've Watch the respiratory therapist take the, the valve bag mask, the BVMs, 
the valve or the mask itself comes off and it's just got a hollow three quarter inch hole basically. You can place that over their mask, their face with just that, let them get used to that pressure for 30, 40 seconds and taking a breath, still breathing in and out of that. And then we'll put the bag on just to help them with that anxiety if they get really anxious with it. The other thing I'll tell you with this is if, if we're doing this, have ALS and mass life support coming or let the hospital know we're doing that, there is some medications we can give to help with anxiety and hopefully slow some of that down too. Um, we're breathing a patient who's breathing slowly. Same thing, we're gonna assess the adequacy of the respiration. Are they taking four to six deep breaths a minute or are we taking four or six shallow? Um, explain the procedure to the patient. Same thing, place it over the mask. Um, we're gonna, in between their own breath, we're gonna try and increase that rate to 12 a minute, okay? The other thing though, I try and time it. If you see them taking a breath, the same with when we're breathing for somebody that's breathing too fast, when they take a breath, try and help just give them a little extra push to force that air in, okay? Make their own more effective. And then in between, we're gonna, so let's say they take a breath, one, two, three, four, five, six, and we'll give them a breath. And then hopefully, if they're doing it the, in between every other breath, we'll do one more. Okay. Um, let's explain the patient, the procedure to the patient. A lot of the times, these guys are um, have an altered LOC um, or just are unconscious. So we're just going to come in, and you can skip that step. We'll do it that way, right? If we don't, if we can't explain it to them, we can still do it. Opening the airway, clear and suction and position the airway. A lot of the time with this guys, um, it's put, it truly is positional. If they're laying back flat and their head's back, their tongue's blocking the airway. So we're gonna position the airway. We're gonna look into it, see if there's anything in it. And if there is, we'll either suction it or use them to get forceps and try and get whatever's in there out. Elevate the head. And we're going to try and usually try and put it in the sniffing position. So, sorry guys, I've got all girls here. So for Jason and Omar, you guys, you'll have to use something different. But let's say your husband, boyfriend, whatever, just got you a flower. What's the first thing you want to do to it? <laughs> Sniff it and smell, right? So when you do it, you usually push your head forward, um, your chin just to where your ears are in the same with your shoulder blade or your clavicle, okay? We're going to push it forward and we're going to take a deep sniff out, okay? So we're going to usually head just slightly forward to where the ears are over the top of the clavicle. Um, they call it the sub substernal notch. So that's the substernal notch is where when your parents get mad at you, right? They stick their finger down in between your clavicle and grab that really nice thick muscle right there, okay? Please tell me I'm not the only parent that's done that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, we're going to adjust and uh, uh, padding based on the patient's anatomy. Um, the one that I'll tell you that has always stuck with me. So my grandmother um, had osteoporosis and I can't remember what it was called, but her spine, her neck went down, her spine went out eight to 12 inches and then back down to her hips. So she was always kind of had a hunch back over to her. So the couple of times we took her in the ambulance, you'd have to pad underneath between her hip and her back and then pat her head forward um, just to try and keep her airway that way. Um, when, we, when she finally passed away, we had to break her back like three different places to get her life flat in the front. So we're going to pat towards their anatomy. The other one with children, they'll remember we talked about um, their head is substantially bigger. So a lot of the times we'll have to pat under the back and shoulder just to allow their head for an adult, we're trying to usually push it forward into the sniffing position. With the child, a lot of the times we're gonna let the head go back to get into the sniffing position. Uh, I mean, it says it's challenging, but a lot of the times it's just knowing your anatomy and phys, and then knowing your tools. Um, State of Utah 10 years ago bought every ambulance service um, for each ambulance. They call them an iron duck or a pediatric board. 
um, that has a little indent for their head to go back into. So there's some tools and tricks that way too. So know your um, equipment. There may be something there that'll help with it. Um, use the ramp position with obese patients. So we're gonna raise their torso at a 45 degree angle. The other term you'll hear with it is the semi fowlers right? They're gonna be setting up in the, on their cock. We're gonna set the head up at a 45. Um, same thing, the substernal notch or the ear over that, we want their head kind of pushed forward that way. The reason we want their torso raised forward and tipped forward, it's kind of, we're trying to imitate the tripod position. If we can push them forward, it takes the weight off of their chest, okay? And off of their stomach, it just pushes it forward and allows them to breathe easy. Um, ventilate spine injury patients with the head in the neutral position if possible. Um, neutral sniffing is kind of the same thing. Any questions on those two as far as positioning or opening an airway? I promise you when we do the hands-on, this is a big, big part of it. Okay. Sailing a mask is really, really hard if we don't follow a few trips. And even then, it can be hard to create a sail. Um, so we're going to have the... Well, the reason we want to do that, though, is it does allow the air in and out so we can get to the lungs. When we look at the mask, they have a triangle shape to them, and there's an indent for the nose. So that part's going to go over the bridge of the nose and then down to the cleft of the chin. Okay. And the mask should be wide enough to cover the entire mouth. The two-hand sill should be used to create a sill. That's where we have the two person BVN, two expert BVN. One person uses both of their hands to create a seal before we back. Um, patients that make it hard to get a seal though, we hit on a lot of these too. Um, other than the beards, they should be wetted with water or a water salt or lubricant. When you guys get into all of our airway bags, we use the water soluble lubricant of consist KY, it's all this. Um, we use it all over the place when we so all of our airway bags will have those in multiple places. If you need to just take cut the corner on that, the little little neosporin packets basically, a little single use, cut the corner and just take a dab and make it a bead all the way around that mask. Push it on there too. Um, dentures should be left in place. The only caveat I'll add to that is if they're fitting well. We've already hit on that a lot, okay? If they're not staying in place, you're going to have to get rid of them. But if you can keep them in, it makes it 10 times easier to get a seal on that person if you can. Um, use the airway adjuncts. We talked on the OPAs and MPAs last week. Um, make a huge, huge difference because we're not fighting that tongue now. So the only pressure we're having to overcome the ventilator is literally the weight of the chest. Okay. So that being said, is a little is Gloria going to be easier to ventilate than I am? Oh, ten times. Okay. So if you get a big barrel chest of man or uh, a woman that has large breast, anything that creates pressure on that, the other one that a lot of times people negate is. If they have a vest or coat or bibs, or for women, if they have a bra, okay, that's going around the chest and it's creating anything that goes around the chest and it's creating an impediment, get rid of it. There's no sense in fighting it if we don't have to. It just increases the chances that it's going to go to the lungs. Um, and that team, like I said, for you guys, we hit on hard, hard, hard on the team part of it. When we get into real life and you guys start running with an advanced crew, and we're going to talk on some of the end of this chapter, but use team ventilate, and I'm going to add the caveat until an advanced airway can be replaced, whether it's uh, a king airway, an ET tube, whatever. Um, for the test, it'll be used the team to ventilate, but the other caveat is, is we want to get that advanced airway. We've hit on the pocket mask, we've hit the have functions. You guys need me to cover pocket mask at all. How about you guys out in Zoom? Do any of you guys want me to cover that? 
organ in the bottom. So there's the picture of them. There's this is a Laredal. Um, every one of your medical companies make them now. Fairly inexpensive on Amazon. It's going to. No, we're all the way. Um, when you guys start running with the ambulance, or for you guys at the mine, I have them there too. Um, if you have to use one of them, we have boxes of them in the sheds. Throw it away, get a new one, and put it back in your kit. Um, mouth to mask. This, guys, as far as the procedures to do it, we're going to do those all in hands on, so I'm not going to lecture on it. Okay, the tips and tricks, it doesn't make any sense until you get your hands on it anyway. Um, all the time, though, the only thing I will hit on this slide, when you're managing airway, it is always, always, always easiest to have the patient's head in between your knees. Okay, you just put you in the right position for all of the devices that we have for design to be kneeling at their head, with their head in between their knees. Especially if you have an unconscious person that their head just wants to flop all over, a lot of times you can get that airway in the position where you want it and hold it with your knees so you can keep it there. So always optimal position is you at their head um, nailing. So, all right. So BBMs, you won't hear most people call it a valve bag mask. The only reason I do is I've done this enough that I want you guys to get used to that. We always will call it a BBM. So when you get on a call or on a rec, we're not going to ask for the valve bag mask. Hey, go get us the BBM, will you? Um, they used to ventilate long breathing patient or to assist in respiratory failure. They provide an in, um, infection barrier, so they all have some kind of a filter system through them. Um, or they vent it out away from you, so you're not breathing it in. They come in adult, child, and infant sizes. We'll hit on that. Um, they are a self refilling shell and a non gel balance allows oxygen and inlet at 15 liters per minute. Um, we always teach in the classes when you guys do it, part of the skills is oh, okay, we're going to hook this to it. If you don't have an oxygen tank or you have limited oxygen, um, by all means, you don't have to put these two options to put in the proportion. Okay. Um, it's nice if you can, but the difference, uh, the outcome of a patient in studies, somebody hooked on to oxygen versus not, is very minimal. Okay. So there's your different sizes. We start on the top. Um, that's your adult, your child, and your infant. You guys look on the infant ones too. Uh, it's got a red circle around it just above it has a pressure valve on it meaning their little lungs if you hit them with the same psi as an adult with a child or an infant you're going to cause um barrel trauma and you're going to damage their lungs so they have a little pop-off valve that once it hits um whatever it's preset to it's going to instead of going into the infant it's just going to let the air flow out and prevent uh, trauma the other thing that comes with them is you see the adult mask, you know, they get progressively smaller too. You can use a adult on an infant. You can use a child on an infant. You can even use a child on an adult if that's all you have. You're just going to get trying to do what you have to with the sill. If you have to use an adult or a child on an infant, you just put it over the whole face pretty much. Okay. So the mechanical workings of these, um, oxygen is tapped and enters in the reservoir. Um, some of them have a bag, like these have that bag on the end. So that's your reservoir there on the right. Um, when it's squeezed, the air, the air inlet closes. So it's got a one-way valve, just like on your heart. So when you squeeze it, the valve is closed and then oxygen and stuff is delivered through the face mask down to the patient. When it's released, yeah, the patient and I'm passively expired, meaning that we've created more pressure outside all of a sudden in. As soon as you let go of that, now it's just the pressure's changed, right? So now there's less pressure out than in the lungs, so they passively exhale again. Um, as they exhale, patient enters the bag 
the reservoir oxygen enters that reservoir and refills. So when you take a breath, you want to see that reservoir, this one here on the right, we want to see it collapse a little. You just want to see it refilled by the time we give a breath again. I hit this on the mind because a lot of the places we have limited oxygen bottles. So I don't want to crank all the way to 15 because I've only have enough oxygen for 15 or 20 minutes at that point. So like if you're up in the mountain or wilderness or for us in the mine, we'll watch that back more than we'll watch the, how much we're setting it to. I mean, I just want to see it collapse and then refill before I give the next breath. So if I can keep turning it down and turning it down to conserve it, we'll do that. So two rescuer BBM, we'll hit on this, the hands-on of how we'll actually do it. Um, you'll see too, same thing, the guy that's doing the seal is at the head with the patient's head in between his knees. BBM may be used in, during CPR too. In fact, we'll use it all the time. It's just a lot easier to do it with that. Um, we'll talk on, so a stoma, I don't think it has a picture. So a stoma is when they go in and surgically place an airway, like in their trachea, okay? Um, so you're not bagging through um, their mouth, you're gonna put it right on the stoma. And what's usually easiest is if you can get a pediatric size mass or an infant, because the stoma is only half inch to three quarter inch hole, and we're just gonna place that over that. You're still going to use the adult bag because we have to deliver more oxygen. We're just going to use the smaller bags for it. So a stoma, it, the skin's just folded and stitched over it and it's open. And a trach is usually a, a hose, yeah, that PT tube comes out. Stomas aren't as popular anymore as a trach tube anymore. Same place. Same place, yeah. Uh, if I'm not able to ventilate through the stomach too, though, we're going to attempt to ventilate through the nose and mouth. Um, obviously, there's some kind of issues up in that area already, or else we wouldn't be putting a stoma in. So we're going to do what you can, but it's not always effective. So if you can't ventilate through the stoma, what are we doing then? Are we staying in the plane? No, we're loading more getting out of that, okay? Um, we'll hit on stomas too. We can also, a lot of the times, the reason they can't breathe or you can't ventilate through it is there's some kind of a mucus plug in it. And the trach, a lot of the times, it's just been displaced or the end of it's got a mucus plug on. So a lot of the times with these guys, if we're having issues with it, we're gonna try and suction that just to try and remove whatever's blocking. 99% of the time, if they can't ventilate through a stoma or two, it's either displaced or we have a mucus plug. Um, rates we've kind of hit on those already. Oh, ventilation rates right there. Know those rates. You will see those on the test too. 10, 10 to 12 times per minute or every six to eight seconds. You'll see go over and over and over again. And then the child is 12 to 20. If you guys get the chance when we get, when you get running, get the Brazel tapes or get the um, hand heavies, which our service uses now. We used it in Wyoming too, I love it. It is a great, great system, um, but it'll tell you I mean, 12 to 20 is a pretty big range. So a younger kid might be closer to the 20 and somebody that's hitting preteen or whatever, getting close to the coming out of there should be closer to the 12. It's a good general, but to kind of get you fine tuned in what you should be seeing, there's some other apps, and Tevis and app, the Brazil tape is just literally a big tape we put on and have also files. So. Roslo. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, this one is a big one. Don't too much pressure. Um, it's going to go into the gastric extension, and we're going to look at vomiting and aspiration. Too much volume can uh, cause that um, trauma, the barrel trauma. Usually, especially with children, we want to watch both of those. Um, it should be slow and gentle. That's the biggest thing that you do is when you do it, when you guys take the breath, it's a. So when we're bagging it, we're going to take a slow. slow okay. It's not a squeeze for all you can as fast as you can. It's slow, um, usually over, should be a little over one to two seconds even. Okay. Um, one hand or two three fingers, especially on a child, can get it. Those bags are usually on an adult of 500. Um, most adults only need two to 250. And so you don't have to get the whole bag. It's just there to give it more ease to squeeze and things like that. Okay. Um, we've hit on that too. We're gonna look for as soon as the chest begins to move, not the ventilate to full expansion. As soon as you see that chest move, we're gonna stop. Things you guys um, might see too an automatic transport ventilator, an ATV. Um, you're just going to hear a call of a ventilator um, that provides positive pressure ventilation during respiratory rate. It already has a great volume set, it's easily portable. Um, it also measures the pressure as well, like it talks to, but it also has to have, usually have an advanced airway place to it. So this auto vent is literally, I don't even dare, we don't, they don't even use them anymore. Okay. We went to like the Rebel has one uh, that most of them use. Um, Phillips has one. It's a green box that we have. Anyway, these auto vents that went, we went to just a pure ventilator that we can do other things. Okay, we're going to take my voice. It's gone to me until 7.38, and we'll start back up. Okay. Oh, for you guys, too, in Zoom, make sure to drop your name in the chat so I get you guys on the roll.
Hey guys, so for you guys on Zoom too, we were just talking. Um, please remember your applications are due by August, not August, September, thank you, September 20th. Um, so that fee and application has to be done by then. You can do it afterwards if you want, but it's an additional $75 late fee on top of that. All right. What application is that? So it is, um, JB, did you get a pamphlet for me that had like the NREMT and the state application, the EMS licensure.gov or not? Utah, not oh, good. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I, uh, I got a packet and I was headed. Yeah, yeah. I think I know so what you're talking has, about. I'll find it. In that paper, in that packet, it has the step-by-step -step on how to do um, like the website, the actual link to click on, do all that for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And now for whatever reason this week, my freaking volumes loud enough for it. I hate this computer. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, we'll keep going on. Oxygen is important, right? And a beneficial treatment. I don't know why we say it's an important, it's a must treatment. They have to have oxygen. That's um, kind of a big deal, right? Anyway, there's three major issues with ox uh, supplemental oxygen too, okay? Um, oxygen is a drug. I mean, it truly is. It's a drug that we can give. It's, it is possible to give too much or too little. And that's where we really, the too much is what we found we're doing far, far too often. We used to say, oh, we want every patient to be at 100% oxygen saturation. What we found is we're causing a few more damages. The body's compensation mechanisms and what it drives are starting to shut off because it's saying, oh, I don't need to. We're at 100%. So that, that term um, has went away. Um, it can cause damage to the heart attack and stroke patients. That's the same thing with that. If we're, most of the time that damages and we're hyper oxygenating them. So where we're trying to do um, is keep them around that only do oxygen, supplemental oxygen for the book. It's if it's below 94% in our area with our elevations, it's 90%, 90 to 91%. Okay. Um, but we always want to ventilate a cardiac arrest patient. Does that mean we need to do supplemental oxygen with it though? No, a lot of the times with them, we don't, you don't have to hook it up to them. If we're doing CPR, we can just use room air and back in that way. I like that too, because there's already, like when we start doing, working a CPR patient in the field, we have the monitor that has a blood pressure caponography cord, oxygen saturation cord, a defib cord, 12 lead cords, all of that's going out. Then we have the Lucas with its batteries and cords. Then we have an IV with its cords and tubings and drugs. Then we have people trying to move around that. Usually it's in a small area. So if we can eliminate one freaking cord coming over to trip over and it's, I, I don't like it. Most of the time on a cardiac arrest, we won't have to want to oxygen test because of that. Um, oxygen equipment in the field must be safe, um, lightweight, portable, and dependable. What we use now is the smaller containers, right? The, oh my heck, now I'm going to say this wrong. Is it a C or a D tank? Mm -hmm. D. Okay, those are the smaller ones, okay? Um, they are lightweight. They're usually the aluminum cores. They don't weigh that much. Um, they are portable and they're very, very dependable. There's, they're pretty well bulletproof. The biggest part with them is the regulator. Okay. So most systems contain that pressure cylinder the regulator and a delivery device. So the delivery device can be the BVM, nasal cannula, or a non rebreather mask. Um, other devices like BVM and pocket mouse can be used to force oxygen into the lungs with that. Um, the thing we'll talk about when we talk about like non rebreathers and the nasal cannula, if they're not breathing on their own, does it matter if I slap them on rebreather or a cannula on it? 
you just waste an oxygen. It's not getting in, right? So if they're not breathing adequately at a rate and depth adequate on their own, none of those things are necessarily very effective. We'll, a lot of the times we'll try it, especially if it's rate. We'll try it just to say, okay, well, if we can bump that from 19.5% to close to 100, maybe that'll help us. But we don't put it on and then just say, okay, well, if that's on now, that problem's going away. We're still going to have to reassess it. And if that doesn't correct it, then we're going to have to get more aggressive and move towards a VPN. Okay. Um, cylinders are a seamless steel or alloy canister filled with oxygen and pressure, various sizes. Okay, so the D cylinders is what we use. Um, like for us in the underground ambulance, it's actually an M cylinder. Um, and then the H cylinders are what, like your oxygen acetylene or the great big ones in the ambulance or those H's. Um, they are green or green and white. Usually to, for us, we have to use, we call it medical grade oxygen. So it just means when they compress it, it goes through a number of different filters. Um, and then it has a different nozzle on the top versus like if you use oxygen acetylene, it's the same size tank, just has a different delivery method and the air in it hasn't been filtered like the medical grade has. Okay. So for us, most of the time we, we call it, it's a medical grade oxygen. And they're refilled by for us as practicing. So there's your tanks. When we start lifting these two, you want to know that the, so patients are usually what jacks of ENTs or paramedics back up. These stupid tanks are the number two cost. So a lot of your new ambulances actually have a, a lift that comes out and pulls out and sets it on the ground. So you just have to roll that tank in or they make um, I'm on wheels that lifts it up so you can just slide it into those. So when we start handling those, if we don't have some kind of a lift device with it, get one or two people. They're freaking, those big ones are heavy, even for me. And it's not so much that they're the heaviness of them, they're awkward. There is nothing to grab on. Okay. So, oh, they weigh, I would bet most of those weigh 60 to 80 pounds. Never put one on a scale, but they're definitely more than a 50 pound bag of concrete. That's what I'll compare them to. So they're more than 50 pounds, Jessica. <laughs> okay. um, so they always use the pressure gauges and regulators. Um, we say that you have the non ferrous wrenches, which that picture doesn't. So in all the ambulances, it's usually Velcro or there on the side. What is oxygen? Why do we want that non-ferrous wrench? So you don't get a spark, you know, because it's extremely explosive. Yep. Um, ensure that the valve seats and sorts of gaskets are in good condition. Most of the time they are, but I mean, these tanks, get, especially on the, the, the um, D ones that we use, I mean, we're taking that regulator on and off, on and off, on and off. So the little gaskets in them, it doesn't, I mean, a couple times a year we end up replacing them. Okay. Um, most ambulances either have them in it or in the shed. There's a box, clear pole, and it's a problem enough that we just keep them that way for us. Okay. Um, we already hit on the medical grade oxygen. Um, always open the valve fully, then close it a half a turn to prevent somebody from trying to force the valve. I don't trust you if you do that. It doesn't matter if the tank's fully open or a quarter of a turn. It will deliver the same flow and the same pressure. Because what happens most of the time is, is somebody will do that and then they'll just, when they think they're closing it, they'll just sit there and open and open and open and open it. And then the next crew gets in because that valve thing is closed. Now you've drained the whole tank. So just do a quarter turn turn it on, it's going to give you the same flow. And then when you're done with it, you know, you just have to turn it a quarter turn back and shut off. Okay. For the test, you won't see a question on 90% short, but it does say fully and then half a turn to prevent someone from trying to push. 
Um, I always store rep the reservoirs in a cool ventilated room, um, properly secured in place. The reason they cool, right, is oxygen gets hot, it expands and expands, and you can actually have these tanks explode. Um, we have to have them hydrostatically tested. That's why the other reason why we use Prax Air is that's they take care of that so that we know the tanks are tested when they hit us. Um, never drop a cylinder or let it fall against an object. So the big ones we use in the ambulances, if you want to watch those new cool YouTube videos, they've taken those that are fully pressured and taken a hammer and hit the end of them off, and they'll go through an 80-inch concrete wall 30 feet away from them. I mean, it's just incredible when they explode the force that they have. The little ones will go through a two by four wall pretty easy too. If they're clear pulling that in, gets dropped and broke, okay? So we're gonna try and never leave it, you know, just never leave it in the um, upright position. All of your oxygen bags are designed to lay down. They don't have to be standing up to relieve pressure. They don't freeze laying down. It's not like some of the other compressed airs that we deal with. So, most of the time, just leave them laying down. When you're changing the regulators and changing them out, keep one hand on them. We'll go over that too. Um, never allow smoking around oxygen equipment in use. It will shock you how many patients want to get in the back that are on oxygen and want to have a smoke on the way to the, or the hospital. Yeah. It's like, that's the whole reason we're here is the smoking and you want to keep doing it. No, I, I would rather not blow up on the ambulance. So anyway. So no smoking around these that are in the okay? Same thing, we don't want them around an open fire. Um, never use grease or fast-based soaps to on the devices that attach to them. It's the same thing that you can spark and cause a flame too. Never use adhesive tape on the cylinder um, and then never drag it. So like when it says rolling it on its side, that's just meaning don't lay it on the ground and then just kick it. Like a lot of the times those great big tanks, you'll tip them on their side at like a 30 degree angle and you can just roll them on their face, which is designed to do that. It's just not designed to be laid flat, kicked and rolled across them. It's the same thing too. I mean, they are a non-porous and it's not supposed to be a sparking metal, but it's the same thing. We don't want to get them rolling and spark it. So that may be why. So these are the tanks that we usually use. Um, this is a D, the upper one's a D, which is a lot of what we use, and then the lower ones are C. Um, we do use a lot of C's too on the gurneys, just because it's the same width as the gurney, so they have a, a mounting bracket that, that slides right on, so we always have it on the gurneys when we're moving from one place to the other. Just one less bag we have to try and move with the patient. A lot of your portable ones, just because we want the extra volume on them, we'll use the D's. Um, we have to use a pressure regulator to connect to the cylinder, usually around 30 to 70 PSI. Um, so cylinders, E's are smaller. So what we use is they call it a yoke assembly, and we'll go through it. It has two prongs that go in, and then it just yokes over the top of it. Anything larger than that, so the big ones in the ambulances have a thread on, and that's where we use those non-porous wrenches um, to tighten them on. They have a thread out there just because the amount of PSIs that they can create. Um, but I will say what, and we've seen this on a few test questions, even on the NRMT, how many PSI does a size E tank take till it's full? 2,000, 2,000 to 2,100, that's, but your C and D tanks are also full at 2,000 PSI. So it doesn't matter the tank size, all of them are full at 2,000, okay? It's just the volume that it carries with it is the only difference. Um, before connecting the cylinder, obviously we're gonna check and make sure the main valve is, slight, is slightly, the main valve, why would you say slightly? You, you just wanna clear of dust and dirt. That slide makes no sense to me. Anyway. Um, we just we just want to make sure it's clean. Um, for you guys too on chat at the mine, uh, we really have to watch those if we found it around grease, dirt, and you guys know uh, the coal dust and mud gets everywhere. So just be really careful as you're switching them out that we don't get any of that in it. 
Um, flow meters. So our, what we used to adjust the liters per minute. So when we start talking oxygen flow for medical, it's always in liters per minute, not KSI. So LPM is the other term you'll hear with it, okay? Um, so there's two different time types. Um, there's compensated flow for large cylinders in the ambulance. Um, we're just gonna click to them. So the one on the left is your, um, your low pressure flow meter. So it's already went through it. It's the tree. The other term you'll see for it is an oxygen tree, the little valve on the bottom, turn it one way or the other and it let, uh, changes the LPMs per minute. The one on the right is your yoke, one, two, um, and that's used um, to do the same thing, but it just slides over the top of the smaller tanks. And it's, that's what, so this one, these ones, it has another regulator before it goes to this. This is a regulator and a flow meter, both. Um, these though, the reason why it has a high flow on it, um, we used to have some different devices that would use it. Now all of our ventilators. So if we have to hook on those for bells or, um, any of the ventilators, they're going to hook to that high pressure because I don't want to regulate it. I just want the flow, the ventilator will regulate. Okay. The little barb one there to the right underneath the zero is the low pressure. And that's where we're going to attach your BVM, our non rebreathers, your nasal cannulas, all of those get attached to that. I'm going to tell you too, it does not take very much to seal that. Okay. Just a little pressure on and a slight quarter turn to the right and it seals. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Some people take and hee haw that whole thing on there to where you have to take a knife and cut it off. It doesn't take that much. Just a little pressure and a quarter turn to the right and it's sealed. Okay. Yeah, you'll hear it leaking and then you just turn it a little more to the right until it stops. Um, and a lot of the times what you actually find why it's leaking is, is there's dirt, there's a little piece of gravel, there's something in those barbs that isn't letting it seal. So if you do quarter turn to the right and it's leaking still, do another little bit of a turn and it's still leaking, take it off, tip it upside down, tap it against the gurney, something hard to see if you can tap whatever's loose in there out. If you happen to hee haw to seal it, the other thing I'll tell you is get another one because there's probably something in the plastic form that goes over that bar that's deformed to or not functioning, right? Um, so humidifiers too, we don't use them in EMS just because um, our transports are short and they are also an increased infection too, right? If we, we want this all sealed. So it hooks onto that high flow so this isn't an oxygen tree like we normally use. This is a high flow oxygen one. So they'll screw onto it. The yoke ones, you can screw it onto. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. So where we hook the ventilator, you can do ox oxygen too there. Um, a lot of the times where you're going to see this on EMS is if we're transporting a patient in their facility. So if we're going to Sampy Valley to Utah Valley or INC or primary children's, you'll see in that way too. Um, these are usually there for uh, people that are on long-term air, okay? Because air is dry and it starts to dry the airway out, it starts to irritating and swelling and things like that. So that's how we get away with it there. Um, like I said, in the field, 99% of the time you won't see it. The only other place that I've seen it in the field, I, I'll take that back is it's the same thing. The patient was on long-term oxygen at home and we'll take their, their bottle of um, humidified air, take it with us just to keep that with them. But they're usually on it before we ever deal with them or to transport. Um, we've hit on that too, obviously the burning creates an explosive reaction. I mean, it's just, it's under 2000 PSI guys. We just want to be careful with it. We've talked about the missile part of it. Um, so oxygen toxicity um, is when those air sacs collapse when there's an overload of oxygen. 
some of this is like we said, we went away from that 100% oxygen to prevent this. Um, eye damage might occur in premature infants. So if we're doing blow by or whatever, um, a lot of the time when you go up to the NICU units and that, they'll either tape their little eyes closed or they'll do eye drops with them. If we can do blow by and we'll blow it from the tip of their nose down to their mouth instead of up towards their eyes or straight across their nose works better. Just so we're not um, exposing their eyes to that constant air. Um, COPD um, patients, sometimes they have an hypoxic drive, which means that they're looking at oxygen. Remember, this is the five to 10% of the arc. Um, looking at the carbon dioxide for the respiratory rates. Um, and same thing with a stroke and heart attack. Um, well, there are so many different devices. We'll go over a lot of those. And the other thing that we'll hit on and that this gets kicked back to the agencies. We don't teach all of them in the classes just because there's so many. So whatever agency you work with, uh, you're going to have to get with them and go over their equipment. Um, so supplemental oxygen, we're going to use these for shortness of breath, right? Um, we're going to do it if they're in mild distress. We're going to do the low concentration oxygen via your nasal cannula. For moderate distress, we'll move to the non-regrader. And then we can also go to, for your protocols, whatever agency you can look at bagging a um, conscious patient to. So a non-rebreather mask, it's the best way to do a high concentration oxygen to a breathing patient. Remember with all these supplemental oxygens, they have to be breathing on their own. Um, you'll inflate the reservoir. We'll go over these as far as all of this, the hands-on part of it. Um, it's the same thing we talked with the BBM when they take a breath, that bag that's on the end of it, we wanna see it collapse and then refill in between breaths. They're a really great way to count respirations too, because every time they breathe, that mask is gonna get humidity on it and steam up a little and you can count the breaths that way. Um, it provides, we always say a high flow oxygen. Um, it provides um, 80 to 90% concentration. So it bumps up from 19.5 to 80 to 90. They have a valve on them. So right here on the right, these little white circular disc, um, the one on either side of it, when they take a breath, that seals so that they have to breathe out of the bag, which is clear full of 100% oxygen. <laughs> when they exhale, there's a valve on top. So the oxygen hose for you guys coming in there with the little green ring below it. On top of that, there's another one of those discs. So when they breathe out, it closes over the oxygen. Those ones on the side open up and the carbon dioxide is expelled through those. The reason why we can't get 100% with it is it's dead airspace, right? Everything around the nose and mouth and all of that, it's just dead airspace. So it's full of high concentration of carbon dioxide until we breathe in. That's why we only get the 80 to 90, because we have that dead airspace. So there it is again. We'll go over these two with you. Nasal cannula. Um, its concentrations are 24 to 44 through the two prongs. The turn, the, what you guys are going to want to remember for it, and it did not say it on the non breather. Oh, yes, it did. The flows, you will see those on a test question. The flow um, is 15 liters per minute for a non rebreather. And for a cannula, it's four to six. Um, the cannula too, guys, a lot of the people, if you put that non-rebreather over their mask, they're gonna get really, really, really anxious. So it works best for those guys too. If they're really anxious, you can put that over them and they'll tolerate that before they'll do a mask. Okay. So there's your cannula the little flat place on the prong. So those are two that go in one in each nair. A little flat prong goes flat against between their nose and their lip just to, so it doesn't roll on them. Um, partial non-rebreather mask, we'll talk about it. Um, most, they're pretty well a thing of the past in EMS agencies now. Um, 
So all it is is let's show a picture. So the non-rebreather, we'll go back to it. So right here on your non-rebreather, a partial rebreather, instead of having a bag right there, the oxygen just goes in to their nose, and then those little discs are gone. It's the side of it's just kind of holy, so they can breathe in and out. Um, that's the best way I can think to describe it. Um, they're useful to preserve carbon dioxide levels to stimulate breathing. So um, that was where we used to really hit it a lot of the times is if you have a carbon monoxide poisoning, we put one of those on some of them at times too. Um, their flow is nine to 10 a minute. Eventually mask. Um, this is most commonly used in CP COPDs and it creates a little bit of a mixture of the oxygen um, with the inhaled air. The Venturi mask, most of the time, it's something that they're going to have. Yeah. And there's a picture of it. Same thing, the oxygen comes down into the white tube on the end of it, gets mixed in, and then you take a breath. And then if you notice, the white disc on the sides are gone on it too. Trace tra tracheostomy mask or a stoma mask is to provide supplemental oxygen for these guys. It's usually a small cup-like mask fits over the trach um, and it's an eight to 10 liters per minute. If you're in an agency that has a high population of those, you'll see and carry in most of the time though, um, it's a same thing, it's a transport, the hospital has it and you're just gonna manage it when you're transporting this patient. The Venturi mask, that's the only time I've seen it too is when we transported somebody. Um, oxygen concentration for cardiac arrest. Um, we say high concentration for um, patients with chest pain and your, um, or anybody in respiratory distress. On your psychomotor test, when we start doing the hands-on, that's the term you're going to want to say. Is we're going to put them on high concentration oxygen, which for us is a non okay. Um Infants and children may benefit from blow-by, so we're going to hold the tubing or non rebreathing mass two inches from the face passes over the face and is inhaled. Like I said, with those, if you can either do it, most of them do it straight across their nose, so the tube's sitting over like the point of their chin and gets blown across the front of their nose. Um, a lot of the times with those, you only need four to six liters a minute to do blow by. Uh, works really well for them, especially for little neonates and stuff that you know, can in a bake or whatever. Um, facial injuries, we've already hit on this a lot. They will bleed a lot and are require some uh, frequent suctioning. Um, airway to adjunct, so we want a ET tube is what we're looking for these guys, okay? We want a definitive airway. Um, suction units are, are not accurate to remove solid objects. That's what we're gonna look at from our dial forceps. The decanter suctioning units, or tips that we have now, work great for it. Um, abdominal thrust or chest thrust, and keep your damn fingers out of their mouth, okay? Um, dental appliances uh, should be left in place during the procedure unless they become massaged. We've already hit on that too. Um, some infants and children, this one is a good one to hit on too though. The tongue takes up more space, right? It's the trachea, we've already hit on it too. It's usually softer and more flexible, so can be um, pinched off easier depending on it really comes down to position in these little guys um, head to get it to okay um, chest wall is softer and the diaphragm breathing is more important they're tummy breathers okay um, and their burn off rate is twice as much as an adult which is why they breathe 20 times a minute versus an adult with 10. Um, we've hit on this, the excessive pressure and volume, use a proper size mask. Um, 
flow restriction or oxygen power of the banded rice are contraindicated. It's the same thing. If it's hitting you know, with that kind of pressure, uh, we can cause barotrauma. We do have pediatric size non rebreathers, masks, and nasal, nasal cannulas. All the ambulances have them in their bags. And gastric extension, we've hit on that too. If that stomach's clear full, the chest isn't allowed to open up in and out. For you guys too, you will assist um, a lot of the times with placing an advanced airway. Um, and for me as a medic that's placing these a lot of the times, I want you guys to have a good understanding of it so that when we ask for help, you can help us with it. Okay. Um, so before we place the tube, you may be asked to give the, ox the patient extra oxygen. Um, what we call that though, hey, can you pre-oxygenate this patient? So most of the time we said we want to hit what range on oxygen on these patients on their saturation. 94, 95, okay. So when we say, hey, can you guys pre-oxygenate this patient? You're going to go instead of six to eight seconds, you're going to do four to six seconds, and we're going to try and get their oxygen saturation to 100. Because when we go to place this, they're not going to breathe for a while. So we're trying to give them that little extra bump so that they cannot breathe for a while and not get in trouble. Um, we'll position the patient's head and the head elevated of the snipping. Um, and then we'll remove the oral airway or endotracheal tube, if you guys have placed that, and pass the endotracheal tube into place. Um, you may ask to help burp with it too. So the burp remover is your pressure thumb and finger over the side of the throat. I call it cricoid pressure. You're just trying to hold that throat and you're pushing it up in place for me. Okay. So you just can do gently direct the throat upward and towards the patient's right. It just moves those vocal cords in so I can see them easier. Um, but it doesn't take a lot. The key is that, is that gentle. Okay. Um, once we get it in place too, we, we need to uh, assure it's proper placement by tooth methods. So what we're gonna look at most of the time, we'll do breathing. So I'm gonna bag the patient and say, hey, take a listen on the upper arm. I'll give a breath. Can you hear that? Yep. Upper right. Can you give a breath? Can you hear that? Lower, lower. So you're going to say, okay, yep, I hear breath sounds. Or we'll be, we'll be the ones listening. Okay, give a breath. Then I'll move a step. Let's go. Okay, give a breath. Give a breath. Give a breath. Um, and then the other method we'll use is usually caponography. We're going to see if we're getting any um, CO2 readings out. Um, it'll be anchored with a commercial restraint. We're going to give a number to all the ET tubes, have a number where we can say, okay, tube is um, placed and restrained at 22 at the teeth. Okay. Every time we move a patient, once we place one of those in, we have to verify that the tube hasn't moved. Do you guys remember reading about the Ryan White Act? That's where that came from. Okay. It was in Texas. They innovated the kid, they moved him, didn't realize the tube would become displaced flew in for 20 minutes, got to the hospital. It was 10 minutes or so once he was at the hospital before anybody realized the tube had been displaced, at which time he was brain dead. So that's what we'll say, it's 22 at the teeth. When we move it, we'll ask you, hey, what's the tube at the tooth? And that's all you're looking for. There's a number on that tube. It says 21, 22, 27, whatever it is. And you're just gonna repeat it back to us, okay? Uh, you may be asked to monitor lung sounds and epigastric sounds. So the other one we'll do too is after I listen, if I listen to the top two and I'm not getting a breath sound, I'm going to go listen over the stomach and have you give a breath. And if I'm hearing air in the stomach, then we're going to have to pull back and try it. Um, we hit on it too, not just down it. So it doesn't take a lot of movement. I think with that Ryan, with Ryan White, it only moved three cc's to this place. It wasn't much. Um, so when we ventilate this too, especially once we place this, you can ventilate them at 10 times per minute. doesn't matter whether we're doing compressions or anything like that. Okay. Um, so hold the tube against the patient's teeth with two fingers and one hand. If it, a lot of the time, once it's secure, you don't have to do that as much. So you'll hold the end of the back of the tube and then the other one is what you're going to hold to be the end. Um, 
and we too guys will rely on you guys a lot with this. If you're bagging this patient once we place the tube and it's progressively getting harder, let us know because something could be wrong with the tube. We could have a blockage, meaning a suction down the tube, do some things to get it to open back up. Okay. Um, we really, really, really do rely on you guys that way. Um, if the patient is being defibrillated, carefully move the bag from the tube, it just pops right off of it. Um, and then if you guys start to see mental status change or eye flutter or some of that too, um, let us know too. And then you may be asked to remove the BBN during cardiac arrest. So medications, we can give medications down the tube too. 90% of 99% of the time we don't because we drill into the bone and we'll give all our medications through the IV. But we can't get it that way too. Um, we're going to provide manual stabilization through the procedure. So a lot of the times we'll ask them, hey, we'll place that patient, patient's head in place. Can you hold them right there so we can go in and innovate? Um, and then a lot of the times too, we will place them on, especially if we know we're going to be moving these guys, we'll place that seat collar on just because it prevents their head from moving and decreases the chance um, of that um, tube getting displaced. Okay. When we use the laryngoscope to tube the patient, we are going to lean, uh, we'll, lean the, we'll lean back. So we're going to lean back over them. We're going to lift that tube up, and lift their throat a little with it so we can get a direct line site for the tube too. So you'll see us do that too. As we do that too, that's where I say, hey, give us just a little room because I'm a tall guy. I got to scoot back a little to do that, okay? We've already just talked about, we're going to hold it against the tooth until it's confirmed. So once we innovate, then we'll say, hey, hold this tube, okay? Or we'll hold it and have you listen to the breath sounds. Most of us, We'll actually listen to the breath sounds. A lot of times um, after I check it, I want you guys to hear it too. So that if this will sound horrible, if something happens and I go back to court, I can say, hey, no, two other people said, yes, they were hearing breath sounds after my innovation. Okay. Okay. We'll take 10 minutes, guys, and start up at 825. Yes.
All right, guys, let's keep moving. Um, we may actually, for you guys in Zoom, we may actually make it through most of chapter 12 because this is a small, um, small chapter and slides we'll go through. <laughs> um, so scene size up. This is for me, this is when you guys, when we're walking up, you're going to take your 30 second, we call it a safety pause or whatever you want to take. We're going to take 30 seconds and take a look all the way around, right? Checking for scene safety. Um, uh, we're going to look at taking standard precautions, so your PPE. Um, we're going to look for mechanical um, MOI or NOI, so mechanical. Mechanism of injury for your traumas and nature of any illness for your um, medical patients, number of patients, and what resources we need. So, scene safety. Um, the only predictable thing about emergencies is they are often unpredictable and can pose many dangers. Okay. I, I wish that was different, but that's um, the only consistent thing with them is that they're inconsistent, inconsistent and often are changing frequently throughout the call. Um, so some scenes that we'll talk about. So as we come on a collision scene, um, we're going to look and listen for other emergency units approaching. On your initial attack, most of them that get hit are actually hit by another fire truck, another ambulance, or a police officer, or something tell all those units are stationary, that's your number one hazard, okay? Um, we're gonna look and listen for collision-related power outages. So we're gonna look for sparks, you're gonna hear them, you're gonna hear the wires whipping around. You guys know how many times um, most of Rocky Mountain power try and reset before they manually have to go reset them? They'll usually try three times. So they'll try and set, if they can't set, They'll try and set again. If they can't, then they'll try and set again. That being said, they can malfunction and still keep automatically trying to reset. Most of them after three, um, somebody manually has to go set up and check it. Yeah, it's just an automated computer that resets the breakers on them. Um, Observe traffic flow. So once all the emergency vehicles get stationary, then the next one that starts to hit us is um, traffic flow. People are looky-loos and when they go by an accident, they want to look at the accident and not where they're driving. Um, so you can easily become a target for them. Um, we're gonna look for smoke in the direction of the collision too, right? And not only smoke, but um, I'll get on this side. So clues indicating uh, hazardous material. So white steam, smoke, multiple people down for unknown reason. Um, also too, like when we had the air, you guys remember the, what was the aircraft that landed and a couple of them got ran over by emergency vehicles. They were in the smoke and foam and they were ejected from the plane and the fire trucks, the great big ones with the foam and stuff on them actually ran over two of them. So you're going to want to look for victims on or near the road. Okay. Um, look for smoke not seen at a distance. So a lot of the times steam, you know, that comes back to your hazardous materials. And I've hit on this one other time, but the most dangerous truck for me to ever come on on a wreck is your mail trucks because they can carry um, hazardous materials. And as long as it's under a certain weight or quantity, they don't have to mark it and they can ship it by ground. Okay. So you could have multiple hazardous materials in there that were wrecked, spilled and mixed. And now we have a big problem. Okay. Broken utility poles and down wires too with them. You can avoid that part. You don't have to drive it. <laughs> okay. Um, so all of these two, um, and then two when you're within sight, be alert 
the person's walking around the side of the road towards the collision scene. So the same thing they can be, you know, there's multiple times where they were in, in, had some kind of head trauma or altered mental status, had no idea where they were at and walked down in front of the emergency vehicles. So just watch for our pedestrians too, the same thing. They're focused on whatever, and there could be a lot of noise or whatever, and they don't hear or see you and just step out in front of you. Watch for signals for police officers and other emergency service personnel. Um, ultimately, they are in control of a lot of the traffic and movement in and out your law enforcement officers are. Um, so watch for their signals too. And we may not know too, there's a lot of times they'll send it someplace because we don't know, oh, we've got another ambulance coming in or we have another fire truck that has extrication or whatever, and we've got to keep this area cleared for it. So a lot of the times our fire guys or other EMS need to go take care of other stuff. So we'll ask our officers, hey, keep this area clear until station 15 gets here or until station five gets here or whatever. We need that clear for extrication. So they'll direct the ambulances other places. Um, as you reach the scene, follow the person in charge. If you're the first scene person on, who's in charge? Yeah. You. Okay. Um, don appropriate P PPE, um, whether that's a bunker coat, if you're fire, or a lot of the times the Ansel approved reflective vest so, or coat so they can see you. It comes down to, you know, we talked about look, listen, and feel. So when you come up to a scene, we're going to want to look, listen, and sniff. See if we're smelling something that indicates a hazardous material lease. And a hazardous material could be fuel, it could be oil, it could be um, radiator fluid, it could be lots of other things that way too. It doesn't necessarily have to be this big hazmat scene, but those are technically a hazardous material, right? Um, around the wreckage of your vehicle, we're going to establish a danger zone. Um, and a lot of times, as we start talking on this, it's the green, you know, the warm zone, the hot zone, or the cold zone. So the hot zone is the vehicle itself. And then we can have certain people out in the warm zone, and then the cold zone is usually clear for everybody else. The other reason we look at that is, is um, I mean, vehicles have a lot of glass shards, metal and stuff, and we don't want to be running over popping tires and damaging our equipment because then it does us no good if we can't leave the scene. Uh, when there are no apparent hazards, at least 50 feet in all directions. Um, and then when fuel has been spilled, 100 feet in all directions of the wreckage and fuel. Okay. A lot of the times you're going to get yelled at if you park the ambulance 50 feet away from the wreck because we don't want to pack material back and forth. But if there's a lot of debris and stuff in the way, you're we're just going to have to park it and we're going to have to back up, buck up and pack it that far. And the big one too, and we established these safety zones around it. I'm trying to keep the big one for me is keep bystanders. Okay, I, I need you 50 feet back. I need you back. I need you out of our safe zone here. If something happens, I don't want to be worried about you. So for me, that's the big one is we're going to keep them at least 50 feet back from me. Um, so specific guidelines when a vehicle is on fire, it's the same thing, at least 100 feet in all directions. Um, when a wire is down, one full span of the wires away from the pole to which the broken wire is attached, meaning they whip. So if we have 100 feet of wire from the pole down or 150 feet of wire, then you're going to have to be, and I always say add air on the side of caution. So if I think there's 150 feet loose of wire, the ambulance is going to be 200 feet away. Okay, You just want to be out of that whip. High pressure hoses are the same thing with pipes or gas lines. If you have 50 to 100 feet of gas line exposed, it can whip that pole width too. That's what I was talking with that. Ah, that was with the stupid orange book, your ERG book, your emergency response guidebook. Okay. Legally, every ambulance has to have one, and 99% of us, they're in the driver's side door pocket. Okay. It's a big orange book. Um, and a lot of us, there's an app for it now too, right? There's an app for everything. So that you can go on and get the ERG app and it's a lot faster to find stuff too. 
you type in the number you see on the truck or whatever, and it'll pull up the information. It's huge for us because if they're carrying a hazardous material, we want to look at treatment. We want to look at, okay, this, it could have a respiratory, it could have a cardiac, it could have a nervous. And if it, they get it, we're going to have to wash, do whatever. It gives you treatments and signs and symptoms to expect to see with these spills. So it's a great book. I always call it the orange book, but it's the emergency response guidebook. So crime scenes and active violence, um, evaluate the threat of violence for you guys. Um, you guys wanna know what is a great tool to get somebody away from you? Oxygen bag or monitor. They weigh 30, 40 pounds. If somebody's coming at you, I have no problem putting that aside their head put them back down, okay? It's easily portable and it works great, okay? But some things that look, that you guys can see, not only if there's a, evaluate the threat of violence or if you're on a scene and you start to see some of these start to happen, then the threat of violence is escalating. Fighting and loud noises is always a huge one. If you come up on the scene and somebody's emotional and yelling and screaming at each other, the chance of violence is very high, okay? Um, if there's any weapons visible or in use, okay? Uh, and a weapon doesn't necessarily mean a, nun or a gun or a knife, right? We just talked about a monitor, an oxygen bottle, okay? Any loose objects that could be picked up and used as a weapon. Um, signs of alcohol or other drug use, um, they're not thinking right. And they have no, their chances of getting violent or easy too. Um, unusual silence, especially if you're seeing some of these things and all of a sudden the scene gets really quiet or the patient gets really quiet, what are they doing? They're planning and conflict. Yes, 100%. Okay. So have your guys' guard up. Where do you never want to be in relation to the patient and the door? You never want the patient between you and your way out. Okay. So whatever you have to do, just make sure you have a, we call it the uh, egress path. I don't, I don't want the patient in my way out or my egress path. And if we can move, uh, you know, when we place our equipment, our oxygen bag, our trauma bags, our monitor, same thing. I don't want to lay them and set them so that it's now instead of a weapon for me, it's a tripping hazard and creating a hazard. So you always want to keep the path out as clear as you can. Have a way to egress out of it. Uh, knowledge of prior violence. Um, the beauty and downside of a small community is, is we all pretty well have a knowledge if they've had violence or anything like that before. If you're going to there, if they've done it once, they're not going to have a hard time doing it. Either. Okay. Um, so what do you guys think also puzzle possess the highest threat of potential violence. What's that? I didn't hear you, Mega, sorry. Vehicle. Vehicles can, okay. The big ones are deaths, death of a loved one, death of a child. They can have them there. Um, Drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol every freaking time, Jason. Every time. If you're coming on one of those, there's the chance of threat or violence goes from 10 to 60. I mean, it's just twice fold. Um, and then abuse, right? If you're coming on an abuse case, a child abuse, um, elderly abuse, um, if they're abusing their child or loved one, they have no worry about abusing you either, and they're predisposed to it, okay? Um, the other scene safety too, like for us at the mine, as we come in there too, we talk about, we're gonna look for multiple patients down. I'm just gonna hit on this too. So uh, if we have multiple patients down, that's a, a real indication, especially for no reason. If all of a sudden you walk into a room and there's multiple people laying down on the ground, um, scene safety there is not, there's something wrong. You don't just walk into a room with people that are all of a sudden down, okay? 
Um, uh, like why uh, weather related scene safety. So we deal with cold weather here too, right? So if we like up in Wyoming, we always had to carry um, snow boots, snow pants, and hat and gloves had to be in the ambulances with us because we went in the back country all the time. So if you're going into a scene, um, if we're packing in, then we need some kind of warm clothing for us too. Same within the summer, if we're going up with search and rescue, um, scene safety is water, and proper boots, some of that stuff too comes into play, okay? Um, you can always judge and tell when a person got their EMT license by whether they call it BSI or PPE. So if you did your EMT over 10 years ago, it was BSI, BSI, BSI. Now it's PPE is what they'll have there you on, personal protective equipment, okay? So we wanna make sure that's available. So when we say standard precautions for body substance isolation, what are we talking? Gloves, goggles, and mask are usually what we're talking. That's your standard, okay? Um, some other things that we have too, like I had the one scene where uh, we had a lady at the time had been running for 20 plus years on the ambulance. She's over 30 now. And she'd got on scene before us. And when she's walking out and grabbing, grabbing by the shirt collar and says, nope, come here with me. And started handing gowns and booties and gloves and a hairnet. Okay, what, am I, what the hell am I walking into? She says, just, just start souping up. Okay, and we walked in and he had defecated and then drug himself all over the downstairs so yeah there are other stuff that's available but yeah when she walked out and started handing me all that about I, I, yeah oh yeah she's she handed the mask the booties the gown um the gloves and um taped the gown around our arms before she let us go in so i said oh I'm, I'm not on call now. I'm, I'm on. <laughs> okay. So there are some that, that aren't standard that we do carry for people too. Okay. Um, so nature of the call when we start dealing this. So determining why EMS has been called, right? Why are we here? So when we stop trauma, it's always mechanism injury. Was it a car wreck? Was it a fall? Was it a shooting? What was it? Why are we called here? And then nature of illness for a medical, more you know, shortness of breath, um, chest pain, stroke, seizure. So a lot of the times the nature of the call, where do we get that from? Before we, it's the first thing that we know there's a call. Dispatchers will take us. So they'll say, hey, for us, for most of you guys, it's 503 or 504, and then page to Moroni for a 1050 PI or a car wreck at 100 and 200 sound. Or your page to Fountain Green for the chest pain. Why is it we're getting caught? Um, mechanism injury, some things that we're going to look at though, is the forces that may have caused the injury. And that's where we're talking um, speed, right? Height of the fall, the caliber of the gun, size of the weapon, um, the distance that you traveled after it. There's some of those things that we're going to look at that are going to indicate the nature of the injury. Yes, okay, we'll hit on some more of these, okay? Understanding those forces too, and we're gonna to talk on these in a few slides, is gonna protect the injury pattern, right? A shot with a small caliper gun versus a large caliper gun is gonna have very different injuries, the same as a head-on versus a rear end or a side collision. We're gonna look for um, other injuries are gonna be predicted. And we usually talk on these with um, motor vehicles. So a head-on collision, okay? What's the first thing? So you guys are all sitting in the car, you get in a head on, what's the first thing your body does? Lurches forward, okay? And we call it either the up and over. So if you're taller, we usually go up and over. If you're shorter, you go down and under, okay? So your body goes forward. What's the next thing that hopefully catches it if you're doing what you're supposed to? 
Seatbelt. Seat belt, okay. What does your body do once the seatbelt catches it? It flings it back, okay. Now, what are your organs doing though? They're going forward. They're colliding into your rib cage. All of a sudden, your rib cage is coming back at them. So it's shoving them back with it. Your body hits and they collide again into the back. So your organs do that same thing too. So when we look at an up and over injury, so if they're going over the steering wheel, what do we suspect? Picture that. Where, what part of the body is getting hit? Chest is where we're hitting most of it, okay? What else? Where's the head going towards? Windshield, okay? So you'll see, if you guys see this for you guys, that right there on the passenger side, they call that starring, meaning that patient's head, oh, there's a better picture of it. Their patient's head just hit that windshield, okay? It's a, if you see that in the glass on the windshield or the side, 99% of the time, that's the patient's head that did that, okay? Um, so their chest, and more of the upper body is what we're seeing if they're going over, okay? So if they're shorter and they're going under the car, what are your injuries do we suspect to see? Okay, legs, hips, okay? And also to your abdomen, we'll see some injuries there. Um, not as you go under it, because your back stays in line. Now, when we talk rear end collisions, we're going to start suspecting rear end and T-bones is where you see more of your back injuries. Okay. So with a rear end collision now, what's the first thing your body does? It's just going to still go forward too, right? But the reason it's going forward is because all of a sudden you had a massive force hit your back directly, which is why we tend to see more back injuries with them, okay? Um, so it's going to go forward. The seatbelt's going to do the same thing. What if they're not seatbelted in? They're going to be ejected out. The same with the head on too. They can be ejected out, okay? Um, so their body's going to go forward, come back. Injuries are going to hit the same thing too. Uh, if they're just a passenger, what other injuries do you suspect to see in a rear end collision? What does their head do? It's going to whiplash back. So you're going to see some whiplash too. Okay. Um, and also too, because it's taking a hit from the back, a lot of the times femur fractures in rear end collisions because all of a sudden those femurs are getting slammed into something. Um, side impact, so you guys are sitting here, the broad side or the T-bone, what are some injuries you suspect to see? Pelvis. Hips, pelvis, and the side of the ribs, okay? The same thing with the neck, though, too. All of a sudden, your neck's up straight, and it's going to get slammed over, too. Um, if you were, let's say you were the passenger, and you got T-boned on the driver's side, do we worry too much about how much the car collapsed in? Not so much, right? You're just going to see the inertia from that motion. Now, if you're on the driver and that car, that driver's side door that used to be over here is now 14 feet or 14 inches of intrusion, we're also going to be looking for some more near significant uh, impacts and injuries, okay? If you only had three to four inches of intrusion, you're not going to expect to see as much. Does that mean it doesn't happen? No, okay. Rollover collisions. You get all of it, okay? The way, the best way I can describe it is, is have you ever put like a shoe or something in a dryer and you watched it through the dryer, all of a sudden the top goes to the bottom and it hits the side and it hits the neck and every one of those injury patterns you're gonna see, okay? Um, and if they rolled once versus 12 times, okay? It's, the same thing we're going to look we suspect to see more injuries the number of rolls they had because what also is the number one thing that injures somebody in a roll of a curve collision all the shit in the car <laughs> okay so if you were in a rollover collision and there's garbage scattered from the impact to where they're at versus somebody that it was i mean you can see the indents from the car rolling but there's not a lot of material it's the same thing you're not going to expect to see as much damage you don't know what kills most emts in a wreck in the back of the ambulance all the crap the monitor 
the monitor is our biggest killer. So like all of our ambulances now, the monitors have a, a cage that they get clamped into. So rollovers, it's usually the crap inside the car that gets them. So this is what we're talking. If you guys look on this one, this is intrusion. Uh, it's just the amount of, so if the door was where it was supposed to be to where it is now, is the amount of intrusion when we talk about that, okay? Um, rollovers, we kind of hit on that. Um, we've already hit on that too. So, oh, this is a rotational too. So if we hit and they start spinning rotation, then what injuries do we expect to see? Head and neck, okay? Because their spine's getting spun on it too. It's the same thing as a rollover too. If there's a lot of stuff in the car, you can see some impact from that too as well. Um, most of the time too, it's though it's the initial impact. So if they got hit at 30 miles an hour versus 60 miles an hour, it's the same thing. It's that initial speed and force on the impact. Um, for falls, um, for an adult, it's more than 20 feet. Or the other term you'll hear is three times the height of the patient. So if you had somebody like me that fell off of a two-story building versus Megan, sorry, Megan, but there's the height for me where it becomes a significant injury versus Megan are different. So it's something to consider. We have, the book says 20 feet, and I always like that three times the height of the patient, just because it, everybody's not the same. I hate when we assign it to a foot because it, everybody's different that way. It's the same thing weight-wise too. If I fall, versus Gloria, she's not gonna have as many injuries at 12 feet as I am because I have more mass that's coming down with it, okay? Um, a child, we call it a significant mess of the injury um, if it's more than 10 feet or two to three times a child's height. They used to tie that into adults too, but for whatever reason, they don't as much. Just something to consider though. I mean, we're not all at a cookie cutter and don't. Age is the same thing too, right? A 12 year old falling off of a 20 story building its bones are fairly viable versus a 60 year old or 40 year old, their body's not gonna be able to absorb the impact as well. Um, so some other things to look at too is the body position when they fail too. If you guys look at him, his right leg is bent up underneath his body. Is that a natural position for that leg to be? No, so we're going to expect to see some injuries there too, okay? Um, what they fell on too, so if you see him underneath him on his left side there, there's boards, it looks like a sludge hammer or whatever too. So if he fell in sand versus a box of tools, we're going to expect different injuries too. What's the number one, re what's the big one too that gets a fall patient in trouble when they land on something? If it punctures into their lungs. Or in the back, too. Okay. We do have to look at what they're falling onto. Um, and like you see his hip, I mean, that's a tool bag underneath his right hip there. So, I mean, he, he didn't fall on just a nice flat surface either. Um, some important factors we've uh, hit on all those two. Oh, and then the part of the patient that hits the surface. If somebody lands feet first versus head first, um, it's usually a good indication, right? If they fall head first, is it usually intentional or unintentional? Unintentional, okay? So it ties into some of that too, as you guys start doing that too. Um, anything that interrupted the fall, this is the one that I always picture. I grew up on Bugs Bunny, Sweetie, right? When those guys fall and hit every floor and head, pray, head feet all the way down, okay? Um, we've talked on this too, penetrating injuries, objects that pass through the skin, or other body tissues, okay? Um, so a penetrating injury to the leg versus the stomach or the rib cage, right? Rib cage is by far the worst. Stomach, we don't want it in there because of the body of the fluids that can lead to them. The leg or the arm can be significant if they hit a vein, but not as likely. Classified by the velocity of the eye and cause the injury. Um, a lot of the times when we talk penetrating injuries, it's like gun or trauma and knife injuries too. So a knife has a slow velocity, but if it has a six inch blade by two inches, it can cause just as much damage as a 22 going at 1500 feet per minute. 
Now, like if you get a 50 cal going at 2200 feet per minute, it's going to cause some significant injuries too. Okay. So we classify it by the velocity of that. Um, low velocity knives, um, damage limited to the area of troop uh, penetrated and may have multiple wounds too, right? But most of the time they don't just stab them once. Medium velocity and high velocity are your handguns and rifles. <coughs> we have the direct damage from the projectile and then we have the cavitation, especially when we start talking in this abdomen, when you have a hollow object, not only does that pass through, but it also displaces air, mass and stuff. So those hollow organs can cavitate and cause damage that way too. Um, and then two blasts or another one that we're talking about, we talk blast injuries. They can have that cavitation. Um, blunt force trauma, this is usually a blow that strikes the body, that does not penetrate the body or tissue. Um, so, so if it's just the blast part of it that no penetration happened, that's a blunt injury. Most of the time when we talk about um, like a fist fight, or if you were in a collision and that car hit you but didn't penetrate, that's a blunt injury. Falls are usually a blunt injury. A lot of the times, too, with these guys, they're subtle and easily overlooked. Um, when we're starting trauma patients and mechanism injuries, um, they're not fully assessed until they're trauma naked, right? All the clothes have to come off. So we start cutting head and toe and we're overall. Um, maintain a suspicion of, based on the mechanism of entry. And a lot of those we've talked speed, velocity, height of fall, age. Um, some of those things you're going to have to have a suspicion. To. So, nature, any questions on those? Not pretty much for trauma. Okay. Nature of illness this is when we're going to start talking our medical patients. So, it's the reason the patient uh, called EMS. Um, to begin, a, we're going to look at the patient's illness during the seat size up and must scan the entire scene. So a lot of the times where I talk on this one is, is a heart issue, a lot of the times will present as a breathing issue. And the breathing issue, a lot of the times will present as a uh, heart issue, okay? So those ones kind of tend to go back and forth, but we're going to look at those things on the seat size up and the term, like the reason the patient was called, the EMS was called, the other term we're going to use for it is patient complaint. Okay. Is the patient, because the patient complaint and the nature of illness may not be the same. So their complaint may be stomach pain and we're having kidney issues or um, like I said, the heart stuff, or I can't think and it's because we're having low blood pressure or whatever. So there are two different things. So. A lot of, like, as we're saying, the reason the patient was called EMS, that's the patient complaint, is what you're going to see it on all your forms, both for the national and when you guys get into the field. And they can, and most of the time, are different. Um, so, actively look for additional patients um, for these guys. Same thing, too. This is where we're coming in if we have multiple patients complaining of the same thing. Um, so some places that we're going to look for, obviously the best one that we can get is the patient, if they can tell us. If not, we're going to move to family members or bystanders. Um, and then the biggest teller that can't lie and won't lie is the same. Oh yeah, no, I, no I've never, I've never drank. No, I don't do drugs. And you look over and there's a needle or there's some of that. And it's like, oh, I'm going to call bullshit. Okay. <laughs> Um, as we go through, a lot of the times we'll have like the drug cops come up and do some of that, things like that. Yeah, yeah they'll, they can show you what cocaine looks like, what some of that can look like. Too. Um, you wouldn't think it too, in this little county, we do have a high problem with that too, so you're going to see it a lot of times and see. <laughs> Okay. Um, some questions to ask though too, how many patients um, on our scene size up, how many patients are present? 
Do we have the sufficient resources to care for them? So what are some resources we have at our disposal to help care for a patient that may not be medical? There's some, what, so what's the medical ones first? We'll hit that first. So we have life light, so we have helicopters, we have our local hospital, um, and in our rural area, we have paramedic resources too. Um, some non-medical ones, we have search and rescue, we have hazmat, we have our local law enforcement, and we also have um, one that I use quite frequently too is our social workers and stuff at the hospital. Or some other non-medical resources that can help these patients. Do we need necessarily need a social worker on scene? No, but we can call and get him coming to the hospital to help, especially with the death um, and a child. Okay. I'm trying to anticipate the maximum number of patients and radio for help accordingly. It's always easier to send them home empty than to wait for them to come. And the helicopter services will always tell you that. They will come and fly anytime you want them, and if they're not needed, they just had a pretty flight, got to see some pretty scenery, and they're going to go home. Okay. And they don't have to do any paperwork with it. So they'll love to come and do that anytime. Um, and a lot of this part of it, too, guys, um, we're going to pound this in. This is what all, so these last two chapters so far is what we hammer hard on our hands on stuff. So don't get too overwhelmed and ah, I'm not sure how to do this. You're going to get to do it. 100 plus times by the time we're done with this class. Okay. So, so, great question. Um, the helicopter services and EMS cannot bill unless we transport the patient. So, if they come and don't pick them up, then IHC or um, air med is the cost of the flight. Same thing with us, if we don't transport, um, then the cost of the fuel will be very um, Like your search and rescue, all of that, we don't pay for that in our taxes. What's that? No, no, you um, You actually do. In our county, you pay, in North County, you pay, the cities pay um, $1.50 per household per year. So it's, Nothing, but yes, it, that's it. The rest of it comes from patient billing or grants. All right, it is nine o'clock. Let me look at this next one. Give me five minutes, guys. We might just dump, jump into it. We won't finish it probably, but let's see if we can jump into a little bit of 12. So I'm going to ask you guys this. It's only 45 slides for chapter 12. I am going to lecture on it till it's done. If any of you here in class need to leave, you can jump onto YouTube and finish it whenever you want. Um, for you guys doing it on Zoom, same thing. You guys can jump on and um, finish it whenever you want. But I would like to finish this one just to keep us on track. Um, Jason, and are you guys seeing Chapter 12 primary assessment on your end? I am. Perfect. All right, here we go. So primary assessment. Come on. The biggest reason we do the primary assessment is we have to identify any life threats. That's all we're doing with the primary assessment. 
And the three things that cause us the life threat are airway, breathing, or circulation, okay? Um, may vary depending on the patient's condition, how many of us are on scene, and how other priorities determine your patient assessment. And when we're talking on that, if we have a mass casualty situation, we're gonna hit on triaging. If we have 15 patients that one of us can eat, one of the 15 can go and help and take care of, and we have one that requires five of us and still has the highly chance that patient's not gonna survive, a lot of times the resources aren't going to go to him. It's, it's a hard call to make, especially if that one is an eight-year-old child versus a group of 20-year-old adults. Okay. Um, how many EMTs are on scene too? If you're coming on scene and we have a paramedic, an advanced, an EMT, and a driver, we can handle a lot of these problems simultaneously, right? For you guys as basics, you guys are gonna own the airway, okay? So as we get on scene, that's what I expect and what most agencies expect for you guys as basic is I want a very good assessment of the airway. Is it open? Can we open it? Um, and if you guys can't, let me know. And then the advanced services can come in and try and open it too. What you will find in the field 90% of the airway problems, though, are easily managed and patients have better outcome doing it with basic skills. Positioning the airway, placing an advanced airway, um, suctioning that airway out. Endotracheal tubes or ET tubes are great, but there's some negative side effects that can come to the patient, too, with infections and things like that, too. So most of the time, if we can manage it with basic skills, the patient's going to do better. If we're moving into the advanced skills, there's usually multiple systems involved and it's just not as good a chance of survival. Um, and then the patient's condition, same thing, age, number of injuries, number of pre-existing conditions, some of that are gonna play into it too. Um, order of ABCs depends on the initial impression on the patient. So a lot of the times we always talk ABC, okay? But when we start dealing with cardiac arrest, we're going to do CAT. Okay? And it goes back to that VQ factor, right? If, if one of those two isn't working, we're going to take care of one first. And what we found is the patients survive better. If they're not breathing and don't have a pulse, we're going to do circulation and then move into the area of breathing. Um, intermediate interventions may um, be needed. What we'll show you guys on the national tests and stuff, and even in real life, um, if you find a life threat, stop and deal with it. What gets a lot of EMTs in trouble, and I shouldn't say EMTs, just healthcare professionals in general, where it's paramedic, advanced, nurse, whatever, is we get distracted, right? We have distracting injuries, road rash, broken bones sticking out, all of that, okay? Not painful, the patient isn't gonna be very happy, but is that gonna kill them right now? No, okay. If they're bleeding somewhere and we miss it or we don't get their airway open, is that going to kill them right now? Yes. Okay, so distracting injuries. If there's an immediate, if there's a life threat, we're going to stop and treat it right now. So for airway, some decision to make. Any vomit in the airway that enters the lungs is serious and off the table. We've already talked about that. Today. Most of the times, once they ex if they get that in their lungs, the um, pneumonia is what's going to kill them. Um, extenuating bleeding must be stopped immediately. Um, so if you're seeing spurting blood or just large amounts of oozing blood, we're going to deal with that. We're going to show you some tips and tricks. Um, to me, the only good thing, especially now that came out of Iraq and Afghanistan, was we had a lot of trauma patients. Um, we had a lot of bleeding that we dealt with um, in the field. Uh, unfortunately, most of our Treatments that come in EMS come from war zones. So what we found in Afghanistan and Iraq is that we were waiting far, far too long to turn up these guys when they were bleeding out. Um, so if you're seeing that, we're going to turn it. Uh, in fact, a lot of the Navy SEAL outfits and stuff now have they're self tourniqueting and they're so right into their uniform. So if they hit an IUD and have an arm or leg blown off, they can turn it themselves. Um, breathing and circulation are obviously vital for life. We have to do what we can to support that patient's breathing and make sure they're adequate. 
Um, if immediate intervention such as bleeding control or CPR are not required, we're going to shift to important but less urgent means. Like if the bone's sticking out of the body, is that important to take care of? Yeah, we got to move on to that. But we have to make sure that breathing is circulating well. Okay. Um, we'll also can start um, oxygen um, administration or oxygen therapy. We're going to evaluate them for um, patients' conditions for shock. So, okay. So some things that we're going to talk about too, and we'll hit on all these. So some keys to our performing our um, general impression, uh, primary assessment. Excuse me. Is your general impression? This is what we're the environment and what you guys are seeing. Okay, so if I give you a call, you're being called to a 55-year-old male um, sitting in his chair, um, having difficulty breathing, and is pale and um, cyanotic around his lips. What's your guys' general impression of? So he's a male, okay. He's an elderly male, 55. He's not breathing well, okay. Um, is he a severe patient, sick or not sick? He's pretty sick, okay? Now, if I tell you, okay, you're called to a 55-year-old male, sitting in his chair, the color is good, his talking appears to um, open airway, and just has complaining of general, general malice and weakness. Okay, what's your general impression of him? He's not, so not so sick, okay? He's still same age group, still a male, um, but he's not sick. Okay, so he's not a, necessarily a high priority transport. Okay. Same thing with the child. So, what's your guys' general impression of her? Okay. He's probably not. Other than the, I think they're trying to moulage. That's supposed to be on her left hand. That's supposed to be her knee or her tip. Tibius, or, yeah, um, sticking out of her knee. That's what they're trying to simulate. The picture's not very good. Okay? So is she sick though? Yeah, okay. What else? Um, some other parts of it too does play into it that she is a child. Yeah. She appears to be, I would say, eight to 10 years old. Um, setting up, appears to be breathing, color looks good. She does have an open fraction. Um, what about the environment? Does that necessarily look like a safe environment? I would say so. And I would guess looking from the skates there, she was skating and said, um, took a wreck off. Okay. Um, so does she need spinal mobilization? No. I'm not necessarily seeing anything that's saying we had an injury to the spine. But we are going to have to look at that, okay? So we're going to treat the patient's life threatening condition that will not aggravating potential spine injury. Okay. Does an airway issue or a spinal injury trump airway? Okay. So if you have to move them to get them to where you can manage the airway, we're going to try and take precautions to avoid excessive movement of the spine. We've got to get them out to manage the airway. Um, apply initial XMR to the neck and on first contact with any patient you suspect um, may have a spine. So that's for me, SMR, you're taking over their spine. So all I'm saying is when you're coming up and you're suspecting, hey, we suspect you have a spine injury, so you're going to hold their head and then try and spinal mobilization and restrictions. You're going to take over both of them okay? instead of a device. Like once we put a seat collar on and back for them, now they're physically restrained from the mechanical device and no longer have to. Um, and we're going to continue to hold that unless physical examination determines it's not necessary or we get them on the board. So spine manual. Spine motion restriction. I wish they wouldn't put fucking 
say what SMR was trying to say. <laughs> Use the abbreviation on me. Anyway, okay. So we're going to manually hold that so we can talk about it. Okay. There may be one, um, maybe more than one way to restrict the motion of the spine. Okay. So we can pass blankets around them. Uh, we used to longboard everybody, and that's pretty well the only way we got the back from splints. Comfort too, if they want to put their knees up and lean against something to hold it, and they're not going to move, they're fine to move it. It doesn't have to be us doing it. Um, specific, you're going to have to look at your guidelines though, too, on when to use manual and spinal restriction. So, like for our AFC, uh, we can clear it into. So, if you're, if you're not any distracting injuries, if you're not under the uh, Alcohol or any other drug use, and you have a, um, you're not have, do not have an altered LLC. So you can tell in person for the time. If I can do that, and I feel down the back of your neck, and I, you don't have any pain, I don't feel anything, then we can clear the seat spine. You don't have to run along, or you don't have to have a seat collar, and you don't have to get strapped down, you don't have to do all of that. If you don't meet those three protocols, and you suspect that, or you just want a board or a bathroom. Um, the look test is getting uh, a feel about the patient's conditions from environment, observation, and as well as your personal. So this is when you walk into the room and you're looking at that patient, right? Like, right? Okay, he's, he's sitting there. From here, he doesn't appear to be working as hard as he is. Either way, now we're going to look at the environment as a clean and small hill. Or, you know, some of that stuff obviously is going to give you a, a really good impression from 50 feet away, and especially with children, too. The look test is really important offense because if you have a child six to eight years old and you come up and I've never met this child, I've never seen them before, they don't know me from Adam, what are they going to do when I start walking up? They're going to get a little bit of anxiety and they're not going to show all their stuff. Okay? Now, if you have a chance and you have me versus Gloria, Who's going to be less intimidating to that child? Or, so know your guys' is true too. When you walk in, and that's what you're seeing, or you're getting paged to a six-year-old child, that maybe hey, Gloria, you're going to have an initial assessment. I'm going to stand back and watch and listen to your assessment. And if I see your knee is the medic, then I'll step in. Okay. Otherwise, this one's yours. Okay? So know your guys' is true and know what you're walking into. Um, it also identifies, okay, if we're walking in, there appears lifeless, um, then we're going to immediately begin CPR or AD. Uh, if they have an altered mental status, most of the time you can see that across the room too. Um, patients who appear unusually anxious are those who appear pale. The child is the same thing too. The skin color you can see from across the room too. Um, so we're going to identify those patients who may be critical, obvious trauma too, right, if we're walking in, and we can see blood and stuff all over the place, and we're going to visit the high fire. If they're in a tripod position, we talked about um, the leading sign is the chest discomfort too. If they're kind of grasping at the chest and pulling out it all the time, um, they're obviously having some issues about that. But all of those things that we ask them the question, have we touched them? Have we done it? I mean, that's just walking in the door. Most of your um, primary assessment is done as soon as you walk in the door. Um, patient's description of, so this is the chief complaint, right? It's the patient's description of why he had uh, which is why I say the nature of illness would be different, right? Um, because they may be saying their complaint is, is I have abdominal pain, okay? or I have right heart pain, or I have, it can be very specific, or it can be very big. I just can't focus today, or any of those things. Okay? So when you document it, the chief complaint on your documentation is what they said was wrong. The nature of illness is usually what you determine through your assessment. So some things though too, from the impression of the patient, we're gonna look at the patient's age, sex and position, okay? Um, same thing with the look, listen, and smell. 
floor, mowing, burden respirations, um, hazardous fumes. The other side, once you walk in, you can see, especially in elevated portion of the way it's having problems, is the smell of urine and feces. So it's pretty fast. So bring up the little stinkings. Um, vomit, or the other one that the first time you smell it, Walk into the house and go, whoa. There's no need to bring you in the monitor or the bathroom to the bed. You don't smell that. I can, after, it doesn't take long. <laughs> and then there is, so like as we talked to Kay, there is different stages. Like there's obviously when they're loaded. All of that, but even even somebody that's been gone for 30 or 4 minutes, they can start to think it's And it's usually a, a urine and feces smell because of the body. But that yeah, doesn't mean really food. Um, no, 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 all of that slide right there. You will see that over and over and over. And what we're talking on this is mental status. Um, so, alert. If I can walk in and you attract me, and I can say, hey, Jessica, what day is it? <laughs> <laughs> you know where you're at. Okay, perfect. That time. Is a big one. Like for me, I just got off of eight um, each two graveyards. Two days ago, I couldn't have told you if it was Monday or Tuesday, the seventh or the eighth. The only way I knew was when I filled out my time card. Okay. So some of that does come into place. Does that mean I have a multiple mental status? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the graveyards going on here. Okay. Um, but a lot of the times it's just person, hey, you know where you're at. Um, and you know um, what time it is. And time's the other hard one too. Say, like, it's, I don't know, four o'clock in the afternoon. If they say four and it's one o'clock in the afternoon, is that necessarily mean mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So, yeah. alert that's we want to track in person, place, and time. If I have to come in and they're giving me the thousand yard stare and won't respond until I say, hey, hey, Megan, Megan. And that's the only way she responds to me. Then we say they're responsive to birth. Okay. If I have to come in, I say, hey, Ellen, no, no, and, he, and nothing, I have to pinch or cause some kind of painful stimuli to get them to respond to me. Uh, then we say they're responsive to pain. So there's a couple of different ways we usually do that. They call it the sternal rub. So you can pick your um, knuckles and rub on the sternum, causes this painful stimuli. You can pinch them between the fingers, um, just anything that causes our yeah, our neck, anything that causes a painful skin bite. So if we do all of those and they still don't respond, then they're just it doesn't have to be worse. Is that better, Bonnie? I've walked away from it. Maybe my mic's not working as well as I thought. Yeah, that's way better. All right. Um, so assess the ABCs. So same thing, depending on the patient's condition, we usually still, like all the forms and stuff, still lay it out, airway, breathing, circulation, but it doesn't have to be that way, okay? Um, our big thing with them was we're gonna identify and correct any life threats. And then also, um, you're going to gather information that will help you later in your assessment. Okay. Um, and we'll talk on all of these when we start, like specific airways and some of those. Like airway, hopefully, you guys are more confident that we can open it right. We can do visit, position the patient's head. We can place a mechanical. We can suction. We can do all of those things. If they're breathing, if they're not breathing, we can breathe for them. Position the head, see if that helps them start breathing. Same thing with the suctioning. Give them oxygen, okay? 
circulation and if they're bleeding, right? We're going to stop the bleed, whether that's direct pressure or tourniquet. I'll we'll show you some techniques on that as we go. Um, and if they don't have the bolts, we're going to start compressions, right? Um, basically, it comes down to this. If they're not breathing, we're going to breathe for them. So if the air is not moving round and round, we're going to move it for them. If the blood's not moving round and round, we're going to move it for them. And then stop any leaks in the tank. Um, so these, this one we're going to scan, look for signs of life, including movement, scan the chest and breathing, uh, and um, check the pulse. Okay. Same thing though. So this guy, this is, he's doing his first general impression, right? He's barely through the door. The guy in the far in the middle, three guys on Zoom. He, that, he's in the, for me, I like this picture because he's general impression. This guy's moved into his primary assessment. Okay. And this guy's your additional resources. She's got the AED and things there too. Airway. Um, if the patient's alert and talking to you, right, or clear or crying loudly, then the uh, airway's open. So for me, um, I love a baby crying. Okay. As long as it's not mine, then I'm trying to go to sleep. Okay. <laughs> On EMS, I love a baby crying. Okay. Uh, if the airway is not open or endangered, we're going to take measures to open it and clear any blockages. Um, situations calling for breathing assistance include um, respiratory arrest with the pulse. Okay. Uh, if they're alert with that, um, is not alert with adequate breathing, has some level um, of alertness or inadequate breathing, and then um, has adequate breathing but signs suggesting respiratory distress or um, hypoxia. So breathing assistance doesn't necessarily mean a BVM, right? So if they have some level of alternateness um, with inadequate breathing, we can try some different medications. We can do non breather. We can do nasal cannula. It doesn't have to be a BVM. Okay. Circulation. Um, assessing a good circulation of pink, warm, and dry. Okay. The other term you'll hear for this is CTC, so color, temperature, and condition. Okay. So then we'll look for that pink, warm, dry. Signs of shock is usually um, pale, cool, and this slide says moist, but most of the time it's diaphoretic. It's the same thing. Diaphoretic just means sweating or moist skin. So shock is usually pale clammy, cold, diaphoretic. How long do we check a pulse for? Sweaty. They won't say sweaty, it's always diaphoretic. So we um, check a pulse for no longer than 10 seconds, right? Okay. When do we start CPR if the pulse is below what? 60, okay. If they're unconscious, right? Like we have, I've had one guy that um, taught gym and full on anaphylaxis, face was swelling up, just looked like crap. And we put the heart monitor onto him, full on anaphylaxis, he had a heart rate of 45. And he was sitting there talking and says, oh, yeah, it's usually 40, 45. It's like, holy shit, I wish. <laughs> okay. So some of it is also like conditional. So if I check a pulse on him, I get one in 10 seconds and he's talking to me. Am I starting CPR? No. Okay. But we always, for the test and, and general rule, we check it no longer than 10 seconds. So they'll have three results from assessing the pulse, right? It's either within normal limits which is 60 to 120, okay? Usually slow, so anything below 60 is what, instead of, what's unusually slow though, what's the term you'll hear? Bradycardic, okay? Um, if it's unusually fast, what's the term you're gonna hear? Tachycardic, perfect. And then we're gonna check for and control severe bleeding. 
Can we control all severe bleeding? No. So there's some of it that's internal. What do we do if we can see they have some severe internal bleeding? What do they need? A surgical intervention of some kind. So we got to get them to the hospital. Yep. So determine the priority. Treat any life-threatening ABC problem as soon as it's discovered. Immediately, as soon as you find that, the primary assessment stops until that problem is corrected, and then you pick up with it. Okay. Um, to be stable, the patient needs to have vital signs that are on the normal range or slightly abnormal. Okay. So if somebody is 110 over 78, would they still be stable? Yeah, can we just slightly? Okay. Now, if somebody was 90 over 40, are they stable? Okay. Um, and then a threat to the airway breathing, um, either actual or imminent results, they're out. Uh, rules out stable. So if there is a possibility like they had a severe anaphylaxis and they could go back into it, are they stable? Okay. If we had to do some pretty aggressive airway management with these guys, are they a stable patient? Okay. If they had a severe blood loss, all of that, okay. Any of those, if we've had some severe and we've had to be pretty aggressive with them, they're a non-stable transport. Or what's it? Is it standard? Or the other term that you guys will hear for it is they are a high priority transport. Okay, you'll see that on the forms and the test questions. If they're not stable, they're a high priority transport. Obviously, guys, if there's no pulse, we'll begin CPR compressions while the def defibrillator is being ready. Okay, we don't wait on CPR to get the defibrillator. Okay. Uh, as a rule now in our area, if we do CPR and don't get a pulse, as long as you're an adult, we don't transport. The only way we transport is if we get a pulse or if you're a child. So we'll still, so like a child, I still want to get an airway if possible. Um, and a lot of the times it's size dependent too. Like if I can transport, if I can go from house to my ambulance, continue to do CPR, continue to breathe for this child, then I'm not going to stay in play. And if it's a larger child, then I do need to get an airway in, you need to get the Lucas or whatever. There's some of those things that I'm going to wait for, but as soon as I can get them to where I can move them and not delay CPR or breast, then we're gone. But an adult, um, in the last eight years, I can only think of one that we did. And it was because when we got going on it, she was laying in the closet and it was lined with guns. And husband was getting agitated. So we did transport her just because none of us wanted to be in the home. Law enforcement was, we were out in Indianola, law enforcement was, so I don't know if I should say this or not, but for you guys, if you guys don't know, from two to six o'clock in the morning, we don't have any law enforcement in a truck, okay? It was three o'clock in the morning, huh? In the home county, okay? They're on call, so swing shift from two to four, is on call and then day shift comes on call from four to six. It was 3.30 in the morning, the nearest officer was 40 minutes out. So we didn't wanna, so we loaded and went and they met us at the hospital. Okay, but that's been the only time that I can think of it as a service we've done that. Okay. Um, determining private, there's many times it's not close to crystal clear what the problems are, right? Especially if we have multiple systems involved in it, um, multiple diagnoses, some are, can be more serious than others. And also does, just because they're a low priority, does that mean that they can change, that they're gonna stay there? No, okay. The other thing too, a stable patient, how often do we do a complete assessment? Remember in the book, 15 minutes. 
Okay. And unstable is every two to five. Okay. Um, we're going to initiate priority transport if life threatening problems can't be controlled or the threat can recur. Um, and then if they have a depressed level of responsiveness. Okay. Continue assessment and care in RAP. And that's where we say if they're, they're unstable, it's every two to five minutes. If it's stable, it's every 15. Some other tips as you guys do that are monitors. You can set them to where they will do a blood pressure every two to five minutes, or every 15 or whatever. So a lot of the times, if you can, go in and program them so that it's doing that. So when you're going, okay, I just look over head to toe, you can look over and see vitals. And then it also, for your documenting, you can upload them from that to the cloud and then goes right into the report. What must, so we, what are we reevaluating? And we talked to how often we're doing it, but what are we reevaluating? Any changes in the vitals, airway, breathing, or circulation? Okay. So, how might findings in a primary assessment different from a child compared to an adult? Are their vitals going to be different? Okay. Is their breathing rate going to be different? Is heart rate's going to be different. Okay, all of those things too. Okay, who's going to compensate for respiratory problem easier, an adult or a child? Adult. Children, most of the time, children go into cardiac arrest. I would dare say over 90% of them is because of a respiratory problem. So they can't compensate very well for it. They can compensate, compensate, compensate. And once they're done, they go from, okay, oh, we're doing all right, to we're not breathing, we're not doing anything at all. So they compensate, and then once they're done, they just crash. To where an adult has a fairly, will compensate, 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 and then it's the same slow decom to, to where they stop compensating for it. Where a child will compensate, and then they stop. An adult does it, and then they slowly start to lose parts of that. Um, so some patient characteristics in primary assessment, um, obviously if they have a medical problem or a trauma, um, especially if they have a pre-existing med problem. Okay. What's the big one that, or as you guys are thinking, what's the problem that's a pre-existing one that throws everything out of whack? Diabetes. A diabetic patient presents so like a, a woman, especially a female diabetic, can be in a full-on cardiac arrest and just sitting in the chair and just don't feel good. So and you put the EKG and stuff on and go, whoa, yeah, there's a reason you don't feel good, okay? We have some problems here, all right? Um, the patient may or may not have an altered mental status. It's the same thing. How well are we compensating for this, okay? Um, and then the patient, you know, a child, an infant, adult, we've hit on those, okay? Anytime we start talking with extreme ages, whether it's extreme young or the extreme old, um, and an, extremely, an elderly person will have a lot faster deep compensation rate than, say, somebody in their 40s. Or a child, a two-year-old, will have a, a lot, they will decompensate a lot faster than a 14-year-old. So anytime we start dealing with the extremes of age, whether it's extreme old or extreme young, um, they de their rate of decompensation is a lot faster. Okay. And we made it. And it was only 10 minutes after 9.30, so <laughs> we'll take it. Do you guys have any questions for me? Before you leave, I gotta get you to sign the roll for you guys here in class. Brandon. Yes. Hey, I, signing up for that uh, that other part, we needed to sign up. It asks for the the CPR card. Uh -huh. I think you couldn't finish it unless you had the CPR card. I don't know if it asked for the date or number or what. I can't remember. So they all got emailed out last night. Okay. So then I can finish it. All right. Thanks. Let me know if you don't 
um, if you don't have it, but they should have went out last night. Oh, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, if nothing else, I'm going to let you go. I promise what you find as you teach. If one person is asking it, there's at least three others in a group of 10. If one person is asking it, I promise you three others in the class have the same question. 